right, the clock on the wall says 7 o'clock, so we'll call the meeting to order of the Committee of the Whole. Uh, first, we have roll call. Roll call. All right. Warren? Uh, Here. Bauk? Here. Bowers? Here. Decker? Here. Gisha? Excuse. I haven't heard. You did call? Okay. Ex excused. All right. Hammond? Here. Hannah? Here. Heidemann? I haven't heard from Heidemann. All right. Uh, I believe you should, excuse me, Mr. Chairman, I believe he should be excused. He told me the other night he was going to Branson, and I should have passed it on to you. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. We'll In the future for the alderman, please call me so I have some idea. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Cat? Right. Here. Kittleson is here. Gish is, Gish Gish is unexcused now. All right. <laughs> All right, Jim. I heard he was dead. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Montemayor? Here. Radke? Here. Ryan Fleisch? Here. Vanderweel? Here. Versi? Here. And Wangaman? Here. Uh, quorum is present. Thank you. Uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Next, we need approval of the previous minutes. So moved. Second. Motions are made and second to approve the previous minutes. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Chair, what's aye opposed? Motion carries. All right, moving on. This evening, we really have two separate uh, but very important topics. Um, the first will be a report from the subcommittee of the strategic fiscal planning. Um, and the topic, if I understand it, will be um, Gauging the public and the departmental as well as the council views on our long-term budget future for the city um, Raising taxes raising revenues cutting services and if so what services? Um, so to begin if I didn't already steal your thunder Alderman Decker if you would yeah, thank you mr. Chairman I think you uh, pretty much said it all um, that's what we're doing and that's what we're doing here tonight we want the public to weigh in on our situation as well as the council so we can hear uh, a little more input as far as where we want to go and what direction we want to head as a city. Um, just to give you a little uh, background information of what we've done so far, um, the committee is a group, five of us, um, went into teams of two and split ourselves up to cover four areas of the city, um, DPW, police, library, as well as the fire department. Um, I won't uh, get into details as far as the department had uh, updates and ideas. I'll let them do that. Um, but that's what we're doing here tonight, getting more input so we know which direction we got to head. So mm -hmm. with that, I think we can uh, move on into the department head updates. Sure. Question for you, uh, and I, I think we discussed this um, before, but for public works, police, fire, and library, uh, is there a particular reason you picked uh, just those to focus on right now? We just we picked four just out of the blue. Based start on with, budget size, we probably. Were, we are we're not going to single any department out. We uh, definitely want to approach every one of them, but these are the four biggest <coughs> in the city. So I think it was the committee's decision that we start with this and move on from there. Okay, very good. Um, unless the uh, the committee has any other information um, or Jeremy uh, we will move on then to department head updates ideas and possible solutions uh, to making cuts and or and on the agenda it says revenues which should be revenue enhancers uh, to their individual departments Alderman Montemayor uh, thank you chairman Ren Fleisch as part of that subcommittee on that one of the people on that subcommittee we have no recommendations we're gathering information right and I'm sorry if I did not make that clear. This is a uh, input session for the council and for the uh, subcommittee to really hear what the public has to say, what the departments have to say. Um, no decisions are being made today, budget-wise, but it gives us a long-term direction of of where the public would like us to go um, for the long, well, like the long haul. So once we start on a path of, of some kind of budget plan, we can stick with it. Yes. Just as a clarification, uh, state statute has the, the responsibility for producing, in the case of the city of Sheboygan, our size, a balanced budget rests solely in the mayor's office. The purpose of this budget subcommittee and the subsequent meetings, which I think are great, uh, is to supply the mayor 
uh, along with department heads and the citizens um, input as to prioritization and direction. So uh, we can't come forth with a right. with a recommendation of sorts, but we this input is very important. Okay, very good. Um, without further ado, um, I guess we'll start with the department head of public works, Bill Bittner. <laughs> okay, next. If the elevator's closed and he disappears. If one doesn't work, he needs to go to the other one. <laughs> and he's back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as I understand it, um, this is primarily a listening session for the council to get ideas, and, and particularly from the public. Um, when we met, or when I met with my two representatives of the of the subcommittee. Uh, they talked about public works, perhaps, perhaps uh, looking at cuts of about two hundred and fifty thousand in the upcoming budget. Um, two hundred and fifty thousand. I guess I, I see three approaches uh, where we are in the big book term budget picture. That's <coughs> continual marginal cuts, which my department has been doing now for for quite a while. Um, that's probably the first one. 250000 if you understand, uh, assuming you want reoccurring savings and permanent savings, uh, probably the only way to do that is people. Uh, positions and elimination of the, uh, both the individuals for the cost and the work they do and the services they provide. 250000 at minimum is probably four people. Um, in my department of 112 people, that's uh, not quite 4%, but you have to put it in perspective of uh, indicating that in the past years, we've done some pretty marginal, uh, <coughs> continually cutting services and cutting at the edges to the point where all of a sudden we're no longer at the edges. Uh, since January of 2008 or the start of that budget, the city's cut 25 full-time positions. In a 2010 modification, where we actually cut more than the budget to help uh, balance that budget, our budget's the same as it was in 2000. So if you look at a 10-year period, we're operating in the same operating budget. In the last negotiations, uh, we actually, uh, in attempting to get a reduction of, of no across-the-board increase, we actually made uh, summer temporary help, which is low-cost help, not practical. And we kind of made reorganizing the department to save money sort of difficult. And I guess I only say that because those kind of things, I may be out of bullets in terms of what we can do with the, uh, with the, with the changes we can make in the department. When I talk 25 eliminations <coughs> over a period of time, to give you some perspective, it's always let's go to the big departments and the big departments should cut. Um, Right now, we're trying to maintain the entire Parks Department with 15 people. Remember, we cut 25 over a two and a half year period. Uh, the wastewater plant is run by 16 people. Garbage is collected every day by nine people. All the street sweeping in the city is done by three. Um, tree crews that have traditionally planted, cut, and trimmed trees in the city for a recent past has been four people. So when you take the scale of those operations and say over less than two and a half years, you've cut 25, you can see how we've changed our operation and probably the biggest change is we don't have uh, divisions much anymore. We just have to do the, the critical things that's in front of us. Um, I think one of the things we have to do is, is probably look at consolidation work effort more than just the big departments. We're gonna to have to say, just because you're a small work group, you have to somehow coordinate uh, that work with another work group. To do additional changes, I call cutting at the margin, even though we're well down to, down to the meat, I think we're gonna to have to see some, some changes. Without a lot of uh, analysis on what we can do, I think without question, we're gonna to have to cut uh, our snow efforts. Last couple of years we've made, we've become a lot skinnier in our snow efforts, but we made ourselves 
not a practical operation to do a second and third wave of snow fighting. For two years, we haven't needed a second and third wave of snow fighting, so we've been able to produce a very high quality product with a, a lot less people. I think we're probably have to cut a few services off that first wave, plow with less lemon and equipment. I think if we cut another four positions, I think we have to use the assumption that we're gonna do things well and abandon some things. So I'm, I'm thinking in terms of that we probably designate three, four, maybe even five parks where we go down to maintaining the playground only and, and let, the, uh, I'll let the acreage be abandoned or weed, weed cut is probably the way to put it. Um, the, Beloved drop-off site is probably go to a yard waste drop-off site only and eliminate all the other services there. Um, and probably need to cut our festival catering. It doesn't mean we don't pick up garbage, do barricades and that kind of stuff, but we also provide tables, chairs, stages, those kind of things to festival that in many communities typically provided through the rental market. Those are the kind of things, they're not intended to be complete, they're not intended to be an analysis of what to do. I think from the cuts we made, both last year through the star resolution in the mid-year, and then the cuts we made actually after the budget were adopted, the Public Works Committee is still feeling its way through some of the changes uh, that we've made. But those are the kind of things, if we're gonna simply <clears throat> cut positions by dividing the cost of a position uh, by what budget savings we have to make, are gonna to have to start happening. Uh, I think I also talked with the two councilmen about the possibility of stabilizing revenue sources. I believe there was a proposal last year in the budget that we worked very hard on that was intended to move the cost of government onto a fee for service basis and away from taxes. In that case, we were trying to make it neutral in terms of the city's cost we may not be in that situation next year that we actually have to use some, uh, some dollars from new fees. Uh, that's been going on for 20 years. We're actually way behind the curve in terms of a movement away from property taxes. I think in Council Bluffs, Iowa, 25 years ago, we worked for two years on going to a sales tax in that community, including pushing for a legislative change so you could have a local sales tax. So these things aren't new issues, they're probably also not new in terms of water and sewer are, are basically ingrained, they're the rule. Uh, garbage fees are very traditional. In Wisconsin, stormwater fees now are very, very commonplace. Uh, those are the kind of things that moves entire functions to different rate based, removing them from the tax and the negativity of, of some of the negative impacts property tax has some of volatility of property tax and also can be argued some of the unfairness of property tax. If you uh, improve your house and property tax, somehow garbage collection is worth more to you because your home is now more valuable. But we've had that debate and I guess the issue is, are we gonna look for any revenue enhancements when you look at, at how big of an issue we have? I would suggest you look at serious changes even if you return or hopefully can return some of those rate-based systems back to reducing property taxes, I think those are more dramatic and more sustainable as we go forward than simply saying, let's find a little money here, let's raise this inspection fee, let's change things by small incremental amounts. And you have to be very careful in raising revenues that you don't spend the money collecting it that you've actually raised, which is really easy, and at least in my department, when you start talking about services we provide and, and how you collect it. So I think one of the issues has to be, is there a way to move to more a stable base, which was what we were arguing last year, that we wouldn't have these huge declines like we're having in property tax <coughs> on a rate base. Uh, maybe we're past that. Probably the third thing that is more of a long range thing, but I think we, I've, I've looked at the, the curves that the financer director made for the fire department, which is what's happening and what's happening over the years between our expenditures and revenues. And really, if you look at that, those proportioning huge divide for those of you who've seen that report between revenues and expansion, a continually ever increasing divide is really just proportional to the entire city that we have over several years a huge distance that accumulates each year. And I think the only way you're really gonna address that is, is to make some real thought about uh, what 
should city services really be? Um, I think we can look at our organization simply as how do we get by another year or you can, and this is longer range than I think the charge given to the subcommittee, but at some point we have to talk about the, uh, the broader picture. I think you have a clear pattern of wealth moving out of town. You have a clear pattern of household incomes in the city declining. And that doesn't change without changing some formula that's, that's, that's happening here. Um, and we have kind of a model of city <coughs> services that probably was created, if you understand city services, prior to the World Wars. <laughs> <laughs> that if you look at the heart of the city and the services we provide, it was established after the wars when this so-called community of this country urbanized, we suburbanized in reality, but we kept the levels of service uh, that we sort of established for the heart of the urban area. An example of that will be I live in a neighborhood in the city by requirement of my job. District 7. That District 7 <laughs> represented well, if I recall. Thank you. Oh. Um, <laughs> we have no storm sewer. We have no curb and gutter. We have no sidewalk. We have no street lights. I live out there with the past finance director and a past police chief, and we didn't go out there be because the city wasn't providing those services, and our aldermen failed to deliver those services to us. Ballers. We're paying for those and have those coming. <laughs> we went out there because that neighborhood's where we wanted to live, without what we call absolute necessities in the urban life. If you go to say, what does a subdivision have to have for our community, we suggest we need those things. And I'm suggesting that needs to be questioned in terms of any future growth, and certainly can we back up. And I'm just using my department's simple physical plant as an example. Uh, but we're competing with the townships. The townships have people moving into them. The townships don't provide the services we talk about is absolutely critical. So the question is, are we stuck in a, a real old model? I guess to turn that into another public works example, when we talk tax base, and I just mentioned it earlier, we talk about garbage collection and can we any way afford to keep the drop-off site functioning. When we talk moving to what other communities have done over several years, we talk about having a garbage fee to provide garbage and those services. One of the questions you would ask in rethinking what our services are, is that a service that could be just provided by the public market and the city doesn't have to be in it at all? That's just an example, that's not a proposal, but you have to, in the long range thinking, we have to decide is the model of city government not viable for our community, but I would suggest from my knowledge of what's going on countrywide is the model of city government not viable at all and do we need to ch change what we think of as the model of city government? That, all right. Thank you, Director. That's, that's yep. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Um, we'll hold questions until we get to our committee discussion on long range direction uh, as we need to keep moving. Um, however, I see the fire chief and the police chief um, are under discussion. I'm sure it's about the uh, situation on the south side of town, the, the water rescue. Uh, I ask for a short recess uh, for a minute or two and we'll find out what's going on. Uh, so is a motion to recess? Motion to recess. Second. Second. All, right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Stand recess, thank you. They work well, they, they probably put the boat down there, huh? It's actually south of the city. Or he's got some planes going up in here. Probably not until tomorrow morning because of sunset. What happened? I didn't hear the whole story. All right, we'll move on. Uh, committee discussion. Is there any questions or comments from the committee? Alvin Bourne. Is the uh, sound system on? Uh, it is not on. Okay. I have a couple questions. Speaker, the, the microphones are on, but the, the system is not on. Okay. I have a couple questions for uh, Chief Demogalski, please. Chief. Eric, are we being filmed? I'm sorry? Is this being filmed? Yes, it is. Is it, it is not live. It is being taped away. Former X. Former X. Evening, Chief. Good evening. Got a couple questions for you. A couple, one clarification: uh, You said that when uh, when you were when you became chief, you had 82 sworn officers, and now you had 78. Did you have to lay off four people? 
Or how are you? How are no, you? we had two retirements and two people resigned. Okay. Uh, the next question I had is, in the situation you are with your manpower right now, how are you doing for overtime so far this year? So far we're doing really well. That's one of the areas that I talked about that we might be able to save some money. But it's the beginning of June. Memorial Day just happened, so on holidays is when we use up some of that. And then some of the other overtime would happen uh, during major investigations or events. And most of that typically happens, or a lot of that happens in the summer as more people are out and things are occurring. So it's very difficult for me to gauge at this point whether I'm going to end the year with, with a lot of savings still there or whether some of that's going to get used up or not. But that's one of the areas that I'm definitely looking um, to have some savings. Uh, do you still have any officers on military leave? No. They're all back? Yes. Thank goodness. Uh, the other thing, Chief, uh, after your evaluation of the, uh, of, of your evaluation of the department so far, would you say that you are adequately staffed if you had the 82 you started out with, or if you envision more, if you envision more officers, where, in your opinion, after your uh, uh, observation in the departments, would you, where would you use those officers if you thought you needed more than the 82? I see, I see one, a need for one, one more supervisor, and that's on the sergeant level. The reason for that is we have a street crimes unit Street Crimes Unit is the unit that we ask to uh, engage in what we would call the riskiest type of work that we do. They're placing themselves in, in the type of situations repeatedly that would require the use of force, um, would expose them to recovering drugs, money, or the other things that, that might lead to temptation and cause scandal. And if you look at the major scandals throughout the country, uh, Rampart in, in Los Angeles, some of the issues they had in Miami, New Orleans, those are the type of units that those events occur in. So not to have a supervisor that is uh, dedicated and responsible for um, setting the course, answering their questions, being there to oversee what they're doing and, and be responsible to mitigate the risk that we're placing them in, um, to me is, is just that. It's a gamble that we're taking and I think it's a place that, that we need somebody else um, to take some responsibility to to assume some of that risk and, and help us out there. If I could just ask one more. Uh, Chief, I understand from uh, your previous staffing levels a couple of years ago on the street crimes area, which I agree is a very important area, the dedicated officers to street, street crimes is less than it was a couple of years ago? It's the same. There's three. There's three people. I put another person on there, and in my opinion, that's another area that, that could use another person. There's three people on there and in the regular um, off day rotation with three people once in a while you end up with only one person on there and, and doing the kind of work that they're going to do They're pretty much useless at, at that point if they're by themselves So Hold just on. so I understand correctly then if you get back to 82 sworn officers uh, which 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 uh, Was and wasn't budgeted this year because of your salary not being in in, in the budget is that correct if you could get back to 82 and we could get you in the 2011 budget, the, the sergeant for street crimes, would you consider that to be adequate staffing then? I think there's some more looking at it to do, but I think that's right in the ballpark, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Alderman Hanna. Chief, uh, first, uh, first a statement. Um, in terms of number of phone calls I get from constituents with positive comments, the changes you've made with how you're delivering services with visibility ranks number one uh, by a, a factor of 10. I mean, so what you're doing is being very, very well received by the community. So I, I commend you on, on doing that. It's, I it's the officers on the street that are doing it. They're Mark. doing a fabulous job. Uh, it, it's, it's just wonderful to see them with parking their cars, walking, back on bikes, it's, it's already making a difference and, and there's lots of positive comments. And, and uh, to follow up on the question with, uh, with Alderman Bourne, uh, so if we really need 82 plus one, so 83 would be the staffing or 82? You don't want me to ask I, I haven't, question. no, I have all kinds of stuff in back. I haven't finished okay. yeah. actually sitting down and, and going through it and determining, but it's, it's, I think it's right in that area. Uh, 
You know, and I just think in terms of quality of life, uh, your proactive uh, approach rather than a reactive approach. And I think Alderman Wongman will agree with me. It's nice to see more officers out of headquarters and out on the street. So I thank you. Thank you. Alderman Bowers. Yes, Chief. If I understand you correctly, we're down to 78 officers. We're budgeted for 82. Is there anything in the works now to uh, uh, add uh, two officers or maybe even four that we can put in this year? Would that be in the budget? If you have the money stashed away someplace, that, that I'd like to see. <laughs> well, I understand, but since we tired and we had two people quit, so that money could be used for at least two that, officers. That money can't be used. That money's being used to, to, to pay my salary and my benefits. Oh, I see. All right. So that. So, so the retirements, the, the positions for the retirements, the money was, was budgeted. Budgeted. But part of it was used up in the time that they worked for the department. Right. Now what's left over is being shifted to, to cover things that weren't budgeted. So technically or originally we're going to remain at 78 officers until maybe the end of the year. In, unless Someone the council resigns. does something to change it. Okay. All right. Okay, um, the names aren't accurate up here. Is it Alderman Bauck back here or is it Hammond? That, okay, Alderman Hammond. I also echo, um, you know, echo Alderman Hanna's comments. I'm glad to see them more the neighborhood community policing, so kudos and we've never formed, uh, really had an opportunity to talk, but I just wanted to point that out. I guess my question is, you know, in addition to this CAD system that you guys are bringing on board, is there any other areas in the technology, uh, any investments in technology you could think of that might long-term help improve the budget situation in the police department? I, th I think there's a couple different areas, but I, I think we're better off in, in pursuing grants to try to get that stuff. I don't think it should come out of the budget. There's an L per car license plate reader that I think would, would really help us um, be more intelligent in, in how we operate and, and do things. You know, there's also simple things that, that the department's never done before that, that one of the biggest problems with a police organization is, is that it's um, military-based in, in authority. It's, it's autocratic, and the reason that we have that is for in crisis so that somebody takes charge and gives direction and, and we can even things out. The problem with having an organization like that is that it becomes bureaucratic and, and it stifles innovation. So one of the big challenges when I'm talking about changing the culture in the department is changing that culture so that we become a learning organization that people are comfortable stepping up when they recognize a problem, pointing out what the problem is and offering solutions to what that is and that, that happens at the lowest level in the organization. Everybody's not waiting for me or, or a captain in the department to say, yeah, that's a good idea, let's do it. Officers, um, our, our clerks, they have great ideas. Just in the last couple of months, we've had, had two things happen where we have um, two clerks that work in uh, court services that basically changed with, with a simple Outlook program and, and some of the other Microsoft programs that we have, the, the way that we deliver and manage subpoenas and court appearances. And so rather than printing and copying subpoenas and signing them and, and using reams of paper. It's all done electronically now and gets sent to the to the officer's email account, goes right on their email calendar, so it's right there and they're not carrying around a calendar book stuffed with, with 70 subpoenas. So they're, if, they, if they don't have their calendar book with them, they can go on the, online and access their, their Outlook account and look right there and see if they have court in the morning or whether the case got handled. So it's just simple things like that, but it makes us so much more efficient and, and saves us all kinds of time. We have another officer, Ryan Schmidt, that's been working on changing um, a lot of the forms and processes that we use to communicate, because one of the biggest problems we have is we don't communicate well enough. If there's a problem happen on, on 10th and Geely, Right now, tonight, the officer that comes in at 11 o'clock should know about it, and the officer that, that comes in at 7 o'clock in the morning should know about it, too. And there has to be a system in a way that we're constantly communicating that information so that everybody has the information, and when they have free time, are, are spending their time where the problems are instead of just randomly driving around the city. Alderman Versi. Thank you. I, everyone said the same thing. We're so appreciative on how you've stepped up the visibility of the police department in town. How have you gone about certain areas? Um, probably, you know, I've talked in the past about this, about unit hour utilization. 
on your, the way you've put number of units in a certain area a certain time of day, is there a mad science to that or is it pretty basic? I just want to caution the one thing I think is really important is if, if the public's here it is to get their input. It's one of the things that, that I stress. It's we need to know what their expectations are, are so that we can deliver it. But I think that the basic policing philosophy comes down to that neighborhoods are the building block of, of communities and what's happening in every neighborhood is different and as a police organization we have to recognize that. Based on that, if we're going to control what's going on, we have to. The real job of the police is, is to control the public spaces. If the police aren't out in the public spaces and trouble starts to happen, then fear sets in. People go lock themselves into their house, stop communicating, stop getting to know their neighbors, stop calling the police and doing those things, and then the, the bad element takes over and sees it as an invitation to do whatever they want. So, our real job as the police is to be out in those public spaces where things are occurring. For us to do that, it goes back to, to one of the things, um, I guess there's a lot of different things that I can talk about, but, but one of the, the big things that, that happens is, um, I lost my train of thought, of course, uh, how we use information to, to deploy our resources. We need to know what's happening, and, and one of the major things that's happened throughout the country is, is just random patrol. We assign officers to an area and we tell them, you go out there and, and drive around and hopefully you'll run into problems. The, the random patrol gets you random results. We don't want random results. We know where problems are. We have to, to gather that information and direct the officers to where those problems are so that they're spending their time in those problems. There's neighborhoods in the city of Sheboygan that, that have informal social control. The neighbors all know each other, they talk to each other if a problem comes in, they see it, they alert their neighbors to it, they call the police and the police come and take care of it. There's other neighborhoods where, where that doesn't occur. There is no informal social control. Um, there's no indigent leadership. People are in fear, they're hiding in their houses, they're not out in the public spaces, so none of that's occurring. So our job as the police then is to occupy those public spaces to reduce fear so that people start to, to get to know them because this, it's not just the police's job, it's everybody's job to, to build a safe community. And, and so what we have to do as the police is to be able to enable the citizens that live here to, to be able to practice their civic responsibility and, and take control of their neighborhood. Mayor Ryan. Uh, thank you, Chairman Rinflish. Uh, first of all, Chief, I'd like to say I sure am glad we don't have bureaucracy in the rest of the city like the police department. So. <laughs> um, no, uh, one, one thing I think we should make uh, uh, clear and let the public know, and I'm sure the council should be aware of it, we have a, applied for a grant, correct, for, for three additional officers in the future. Not, we're in the process of in applying process for it. Of, uh, and hopefully we can get that. We all, uh, the feds will fund uh, three officers for a period of three years. We have to fund the fourth year, and that may fill part of the gap that we're in right now, hopefully. So. Good use of revenue enhancer. Thank you. Finding grants. When he's out there, in some cases, it's our money, so might as well right. bring it here. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Decker. Uh, I actually had a comment on the library, so as long as oh. everybody's finished with the chief. That's all the lights I have, so. Thanks, chief. Okay. Thank you. Um, I would just like to uh, um, clear up, I think, what is uh, some misinterpretation. Um, I have here in my hands the state statute for the library, MOE, maintenance of effort. And in big bold letters it says expulsion. With the approval of the division, meaning the state, a public library system may expel, public library system meaning the Eastern Shores, or reduce aids or services to a municipality or county that fails to meet the requirements under. So what I am reading here is far different than what I'm understanding when other people are presenting it. Um, I guess what I'm feeling when we're hearing from others is that no matter what, if we go below MOE, it's basically a done deal. We're kicked out. Reading this, that's far from the case. Um, it's my understanding that if we were to go below MOE, it, uh, the Eastern Shores Library System has to get clearance through the state before they can even touch us. Um, with the state putting caps on our spending, 
I, I don't know if, uh, how lenient they would be at this point. So it's, it's something to think about. And I just wanted to clear it up because I think a lot of people have a little uh, misinterpretation as to how this is spelled out. One moment, some of the committee comments. Alderman Bauck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to piggyback on uh, Jeremy's comments, um, in light of the fact that they have that discretion, it's up to them, and in the committee uh, conversation we had with uh, uh, Director Winkle, um, she indicated that, um, I apologize, I'm frazzled. Um, where was I going? Oh, Eastern Shores. Um, it, it hurts Eastern Shores to kick us out in this area because we are the big repository in this area, as I understand it. And so for them to kick us out hurts them about as much as it hurts us. And so if there is discretion at the state level and it hurts ESL as much as it hurts us if there is a kicking out, then I would think there would be a very difficult conversation. If the state chooses to kick us out, then I think every taxpayer in Sheboygan has a gripe with Terry and Joe to say, what are you doing kicking us out when this, this is mutually beneficial? We get that we're below MOE, but to kick us out hurts the SLS as much as it does us. So that's comment one. And the second one is, and, and uh, President Gisha, you may be able to help with this. Last year, as we were having the very difficult budgetary conversations, one of the very difficult but very public conversations I think I remember was, I think the council was prepared to take the library below MOE last year, and then some money appeared from some accounts, and I forget what accounts those were, but there was a, okay, we will give you, we will live up to the obligation of MOE, but there was this give back that was part of that agreement, wasn't there? Uh, and so where I'm going with that and why I mention that is because some people may be under the misunderstanding that it's really only a net $2,000 that costs us that half a million dollars. But based on the way we structured the 2009 budget, it's actually a lot more incrementally high. Without that give back, we'd be giving the library a lot more than just $2,000, wouldn't we? And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mayor Ryan and Director Winkley, I'm sure you'll want to respond. Um, uh, well, Mayor Ryan thank, thank you, Chairman Renflesh. I, I just thought that the uh, council should be aware um, I had a meeting last week with uh, the, the heads of the League of Municipalities and the uh, uh, Wisconsin Alliance of Cities, soon to be uh, uh, brought into under one umbrella, I believe it's going to be called the Urban League is what they're going to call it. Um, so there'll be one organization that uh, represents municipalities uh, in the state. Um, and they, are, uh, they have identified the maintenance of effort as one of the uh, uh, issues at the state level that they plan on addressing this year. Um, in the state legislature uh, to uh, because everybody and speaking with other uh, mayors and uh, um, administrators uh, around the state everybody's in the same boat and so I believe that the uh, whole maintenance of effort issue um, may change this year that uh, that that uh, that come the compounding of, uh, of possibly reducing the library budget may not be an issue Again. Dr. Trinkle, if you would, uh, respond. Uh, Alderman Hannah, I see you punched in. Um, I really have we're over time, so for the next topic, uh, I'll let Director Wrinkle respond, please. And that we will get to you, but just so the council is aware, we're into our fire department time now. My approach to the um, jeopardy or risk of expulsion, if you will, comes from years of conversations with um, Michael Cross, who is the head of the public library development team of the Division for Libraries, Technology, and Community Learning, which is part of the Department of Public Instruction. And this topic has come up before because naturally the city has looked at this situation in recent years. And um, what Mike Cross ends up telling me is yes, it is Eastern Shores Library System that does the expulsion. And yes, there is an expectation on the part of the state that the system will uphold the statute and will expel a library that does not comply. There is a process wherein DLTCL will come in and talk with a municipality or other entity that's not meeting one of the system membership requirements. MOE is not the only one. So it's not like, you know, on January 1, we would be out. But when I've talked with him in the past about magnitude of missing 
hitting <laughs> that MOE uh, funding requirement, if you will, if it's several thousand dollars for a library our size, maybe ten thousand dollars, there's you know some sort of hope that there can be uh, a resolution in negotiations or conversations between DLTCL and the city in this case. If there's a very large difference, it's been my understanding and the information from Mike Cross has always indicated that if things aren't moving along, then the reduction of service and the expulsion is expected. There's a group of system resource and system and resource library directors in the state. And when we started to go into this economic downturn time, uh, they met. I wasn't there. I have the minutes from the meeting. And what they decided to do was to take a firm, and I'm paraphrasing, a firm approach on uh, libraries, municipalities, et cetera, funding authorities that don't meet the system requirements. They got together and decided that, that that's what they were going to do. If there is movement and there's going to be a change and there's going to be instruction to DLTCL because of the economic downturn that it's going to back off that stance, that would change things, obviously. I don't have that information, and I appreciate Mayor Ryan sharing that with us this evening. But none of the information that I've ever had in these conversations with representatives of DLTCL or Eastern Shores has indicated to me that expulsion would not result. Alderman Hanna? I have an urgent phone call, and I just want to ask if I can be excused for five minutes. Please. Thank you. All right, the lights are off. Um, moving on to the uh, next item on the agenda. Um, the second part uh, dealing with the fire departments. Um, and as we go forward, um, two things to keep in mind that uh, we do have a short term budget um, crisis within the department with overtime. Uh, so we're looking at uh, both short term solutions to this budget problem as well as um, possible long term structural changes to the department as well. Um, so really, as we, go, as we go through, keep in mind there are two items. Uh, the key one right now, though, is dealing with the uh, short-term, as far as I'm concerned, the short-term budget crisis that we're facing, and we need to make a decision. So first on the agenda is RC number 321011 by Public Protection Safety, whom was referred to RO number 231011 by City Clerk submitting incident detail prints, Sheboygan Police Department, and a summary of ambulance response times for the period 1110 through 33110, submitted by Alderperson Versi. Alderman Versi. Thank you, Chair, Mr. Chairman. You could ask probably a fire chief or actually deputy chief butler if he's here just to go over i did receive his wards reports and even within his own wards reports i went through each and every call um, there were several actually concerns of mine because actually a couple of these become liabilities of the city um, some of them actually were 911 um, calls to pd that were totally missing on the wards reports um, there were a total of six incidents that were missing totally from your wards reports that were not that were actually on the PD reports. In, in my, I mean, it's just a concern because that can become a huge liability to the city if there's. I mean, for reporting these wards reports to the state, they got to be, you know, that's the whole discrepancy here is the accuracy of both reports, one or the other. I mean, we went. That's why when I went through, um, tried to look at all these and wondering who makes the. the the determination on when to round these times down because all the ones, your wards reports that I have are just solid minutes. There's no minutes and seconds like the PD. Who makes the decision to round the time up and round the time down? Um, again, I apologize. Deputy Chief Butler is uh, out at a, one of the calls that we have going on tonight and he does uh, most of this information. But the rounding of the calls on the wards report, if you look at all the numbers are rounded, it's just a typical, if it's below 30 seconds, it's rounded down. If it's above 30 seconds, it's rounded up. And that's where I, 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 hope, I was hoping that was the case, but in a lot of cases, I went through every single one, and that's where, you know, pushing the button or computer systems. But uh, to my knowledge and to my understanding that the, the police response times and I'm one dispatch records are actually the legal documents that if any kind of a court battle would happen, happen, they would go to the police records, not the wards reports. So just going through those, a lot of these, I mean, even your good times that, that were on the PD times were rounded up or rounded down when they could have been better on your wards reports, they weren't. 
but a majority of them were actually higher times that were rounded down and some of them were you know zero you know one second response times and we discussed that as that was just no one reported on scene which overall obviously helps response times total response times but I mean just the concern on that is you know I know we talked about the CAD system becoming a lot easier around, around the horn but short term I mean we got to do find some better way to communicate between us the fire department and the police department with their response times because you know now we're on TV for fire department response times we got to yeah, and again a lot of this is is human error it's system error because we just do not have the computer systems in in place to accurately record these uh, the ones where you're you're not seeing the times on your uh, run report from dispatch are the ones where we possibly were in a unit that did not have an MDC our backup units do not have computers so that would not be logged that way if a dispatcher just missed it if we did if we failed to call in um, due to operator error or the excitement of the call or whatever on those calls then they typically would go back and listen to the dispatch tape then the dispatcher would give them over the telephone the time that it came in so it's not going to be logged on a hard copy a lot of times okay so I mean even with the words reports those the the missing um, incidents should be somewhere inputted on there so it gets when you submit it to the state level all the incidents match up the, the wards reports are all the calls that we send to our biller those, right. those go to wards also so if there's I mean I'm not aware of six calls that you're saying that you're you're seeing numbers are those calls may have been codated that we never even went to the call um, they may have been calls that Orange Cross covered for us um, you know I can't answer just exactly. cross without with, looking with, at them I don't sure. have that information just cross-checking with the PD records they were initial calls there was arrive time dispatch time and overall response time and with addresses so they weren't called off mm -hmm. so actually someone arrived at the time so I mean, again, that just concerned me being seeing provided those. that information you're looking at information that I don't have so. you gave me this but I don't have you, you didn't show me the calls that aren't showing up because I found that after you gave me your reports because I went through your reports for, you know and <coughs> cross-checked the reports that's the reason Alderman Hanna oh, thank you um, and this is just uh, anecdotal evidence I, I served two terms as chair of the public protection and safety um, and during that time period I think we received one complaint on response time uh, and, and the public is not shy about complaining about response times. We received one complaint and that related really to a miscommunication at the dispatch level uh, for an incident that dealt with, correct me if I'm wrong, it was a retirement home pickup. It, it was a non-emergency transfer from one of the yeah. nursing but homes. It, but I hope, I hope you and all of them in Versi get together and reconcile those numbers. I think that's valid questions. Um, uh, and it just was my experience on that committee. Um, I expected more, you know, complaints because that's just the nature of the business. And that didn't happen. There was only one that I received that was documented, uh, and there was a solid explanation. So if you guys can reconcile that, that'd be terrific. Sure. And just a discrepancy, like I said, you know, even in the board support that you gave me, the whole this whole thing came about with the last quarterly report that was submitted with the 20 calls over even and that was the other thing too is just in your old in your own wards reports with the rounding of times you reported 20 were over the six minutes and right in your reports there's 25 I mean it's not I mean five calls isn't a big deal but I mean just as trying to get as accurate as possible in all of our reporting systems we need to find some common ground to, to get our numbers accurate because if it's getting scrutinized you want to be covering your butt and again when CAD RMS comes before the council I sure hope you vote for it because we won't be standing here having this discussion he's, he's on record of supporting that <laughs> right uh, these uh, these these six calls in question that is six out of how many well which six I mean you're talking about just I mean, you're, six you're talking about six here? six calls or six uh, six discrepancies out of how many no there's how 43 many? discrepancies if you want to go that far three uh, discrepancies out of how many 43, 43. But the six incidents that are missing are just with a, a quarterly is 655. Okay, 43 discrepancies out of how many? Six. May, may I? 
Speak, Mayor. Out of 655 calls for the first quarter of 2010, 20 calls were above the six-minute mark. Is what the, was on the last yep, quarterly that's right. report. That's the report I have. Thank you. So where are you, okay. where are you going with the question? I, I'm just wondering, you know, you have six calls out of 655. 655. It's on the last no, report. That was just that, not reported? That's a liability of the city when you don't report them. And I, I, just wonder, I just wonder where this conversation is going. Are you just trying to embarrass the chief or are we actually oh. going to get, get to something here? Because it seems, to to it seems to me. Trying to get it, an answer. Okay, it seems to me um, <clears throat> that he's given an explanation that it is probably human error. Okay, this is, this, is the, this is not all done via computer. This is done by human beings. And I'm just wondering where this conversation is going. Alderman Buck. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And I, I hope the mayor isn't going to scold me like he just did Alderman Versi, but it's your committee. Um, I have a question <laughs> from the Greater Sheboygan Committee report. And we get, as alder persons, we get data from a lot of sources, and we have to take them uh, all and kind of put them all together and frame an opinion based on the totality of the information. Alderman Buck. So, uh, that report's not on the agenda this evening. Oh, uh, right, but it's a public document, and oh, I don't even need the uh, report if that's what you're concerned about. Please continue. So um, uh, it has come to my attention, Chief, and I don't know if it's credible or not, so I'm going to ask you this question. Something about we don't, with the failure of uh, SFD to file response time data with the NFIRS since 2006. And so I don't think we're doing that, but someone has mentioned that to me, and so I want to give you the chance to say that's a bunch of hooey. No, that's actually true. Um, hasn't been done since. Uh, it was not mandated until 2008. Uh, at that time, the state mandated it, and it had to be submitted electronically. Prior to that, we were in compliance. We were doing it on carbonless forms, which are all still sitting in the station, um, all filled out. Uh, at that time, when the state mandated it to be submitted electronically, we were told uh, Pro Phoenix was coming as a software program for the fire department. That never happened. Um, there were about two or three other ones that we were told were coming. That never happened. Uh, in the meantime, and that was prior to me being selected as chief, it was decided it did not make sense for the fire department to go out and spend, I don't know how many tens of thousands of dollars to get the software programs to be in compliance when we kept being tell, told that it was coming and hopefully um, actually, with the new EMS billing agency, that program was included in that package for free. So we thought by August we were going to be compliant. Um, there's been a delay in that. So as soon as that is put in place or the CAD RMS is put in place. That'll fix that. We'll and does that put that. us at any risk not reporting to the state or the feds or whoever that goes to? Does that put us at any risk for losing any funding or anything like that? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That was, that was actually my question. With the, uh, to my understanding, that those NIFRS reports were kind of mandatory to receive any federal funding. No, not at all. Not okay. to my knowledge, because we're not getting much federal funding, so I don't <laughs> think we're missing out. On it. <laughs> if there's any grants that are yes. given. Alvin Bourne. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, with all due respect to the mayor and uh, Chief Herman. Uh, I believe a few meetings ago, Chief Herman, you were very, very critical of some Orange Cross response times. And whether it's Orange Cross or any other private provider, uh, this council has a question and an alderman has, a, uh, has the right to look at your response times and make sure that your response times are as good uh, as you know what you're claiming them to be. And I think Alderman Verse made a very, very good point in this litigious society that we're in, we better make darn sure that your wards reports are matching up with the 9-11 uh, dispatchers because if it goes to the court, it's the 9-11 dispatchers that create a huge potential legal liability for us. Thank you. And I don't have a problem with somebody raising that question. And when Alderman Versi came in and we went through um, all the discrepancies, um, I thought that we had reconciled them. These six new ones I'd be willing to look at and see what the problem is. Um, I have no problem with that. Uh, to be honest, response times are the least of our problems right now. And I guess I would defer to Alderman Gisha, who has been carrying one of our radios for the last month or five weeks. Uh, the proof is in the pudding. It's there. I mean, we're not, we have good response times. We're, we're very proud of those. And Alderman Bowers. I'm sorry. Yes, Chief. I have had the radio for, for a couple of weeks. Actually, my wife has been listening to it more than I, just so I can get a flavor of the type of calls and the how often there's two 
EMSs out instead of three and so forth. And uh, it actually drives me crazy, but she likes it. <laughs> <laughs> Alderman Bowers. Well, that brings up another point since uh, Alderman Gish had a radio. How many other uh, Aldermen had access to radios? Uh, I only have one extra, and it was my intent that after he had it for a few weeks that we would pass it on to somebody else. You're welcome to have it immediately if you wish. <laughs> <laughs> Put the names in a hat and draw it out. <coughs> okay, Chief, I, uh, the question I have was brought up to me. Uh, are you familiar with B2 comp time? Yes. Okay, could you tell me, uh, I've been led to believe that the firemen could either take this comp time in overtime or they can add it on to the retirement program. Is that correct? That is incorrect. Incorrect? Yeah. B2 comp time must be taken in time off. Must be taken in time off. It cannot be added to the retirement program. No. All right. Uh, now, when they put this in a bank, when do they have to collect the uh, comp time? At the end of the year, a year later, or wh when is it done? It's at the fire chief's discretion as to how long they hold that for or how many hours I allow them to build up. The, the B2 comp time is given to employees, so I don't have to pay them time and a half. Well, the, okay. It's in lieu of overtime pay. So each fireman has the option of either taking it in pay or putting, like, money in the bank. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. So then if, then if we're paying overtime, could those firemen that have comp time in the bank, couldn't we call them in? Comp time, Alderman Bowers, is time off, not time that I can call them in. Well, let's say... They, they are taking their B2 comp time yeah. to give the city savings. Uh -huh. They have the right to... When I order somebody in for overtime, they have a right to tell me, and it's law, that I have to pay them time and a half. Okay. We have given them an option of taking comp time to save the city overtime dollars. All right. Typically, they take that time off at a time of the year when we have manpower that allows it. Are there any um, limits that a fireman may live outside the city, like 10 miles, 15, 20 miles? The council set those limits. So we had, now have a gentleman or a firefighter living in Wanawak? In where? Wanna walk? Octoma. <laughs> Never heard of that city. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, it, we apparently have moved on from the original topic here. Can I ask to file then RC number 321011 so we can get second. on to the other questions? Motion's been made and, and seconded to file the document. I was actually lit up for one last before I did that. I was actually lit up first there. It's actually one I just kind of directed to the mayor. The whole reasoning behind the the dispatch times is I went back when um, Alderman Kittleson and Alderman Montemeyer uh, headed the coalition um, that basically took over in all of um, EMS responses and everything else, and I got all their um, reports from two 2005, 2006, 2007, which the only reason why I went back through these is because um, the at that time it was Orange Cross that had that, had to mark and coincide with every 911 call from the police department. and any times that were not on here, any discrepancies there had, they had to report back to the coalition with reports. That was the whole basis behind my questioning, is uh, these reports and the responses that they had, they had to go off of here, and you're just going off a different report, and that was what raised the question to begin with. Um, and also the compliance ratings, um, yes, we, had, we, just, we talked that and talked about the 10% was actually less than that because of the computer you know, between the two reports. But uh, just compliance ratings for the, hitting the 90% every, every single month, um, you know, we went back, I went back through, like I said, 05, 06, and 07, and they had to document everything when the police department arrived, when the fire department arrived, when Orange Cross arrived. Mm -hmm. So I was just kind of wondering what the, the lack of paperwork now, I guess, it just makes it more e you know, easier for us to just go off of one report instead of reporting to you know, PPNS now as what directed this whole question was because of those the old coalition, which is no longer in existence. So that was, you know, maybe that's a clarifying question of the mayor and where this all came from. May I? Thank you, Chairman. Just cl to clarify that, we were at our meeting, we were just going through the submit, submitting the city of Sheboygan Fire Department's first quarter EMS quality assurance and quality improvement report for January 1, 2010 through March 31st, 2010. That's what we, we were just going through that Correct. report. Yep. And, and what didn't, and we didn't, 
I mean, we followed, and, and the report was given, and we looked at it, and, and we approved it as it was, correct? Yeah, that's, I was just saying to question from the coalition, going off of police department times oh, versus the their own times. Because okay. oh, to my understanding, Orange Cross also does wards, the, to okay. my understanding. So they have the yes, same. So same it was reporting. the coalition that was questioning the report? Correct. All right, we've had a motion and a second uh, to file RC or recommend filing RC 3210-11. Any other discussion on that motion? Seeing all in favor say aye. 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 Chair votes aye opposed. Motion carries. Next council, agenda number 5-68 by strategic fiscal planning. To whom was referred RO number 29-10-11 by the finance director treasurer submitting the Sheboygan Fire Department ambulance service alternative scenarios and benchmarking analysis. Recommends that the report of officer be accepted and placed on file and to accept solution D to keep five stations in ambulance. We'll take this jointly with number C. Council agenda number 5-37 by the city clerk submitting potential local transports market analysis and operational analysis based on city of Sheboygan finance department alternative scenarios and benchmarking analysis report dated May 3rd, <coughs> 2010. Yeah. Okay, just, a, just a quick question of clarification. I've got in front of me taxpayer financial impact of operation scenario. It looks to me like alternative B is actually the D is actually the second scenario. Am I correct? That's five stations with ambulance services and 73 firefighters. I just want to make sure that yeah, this was the typo that we caught on council. It should have been solution D. The question I, is, is that scenario is, Yes, is that, is that scenario the XL file D? from today? It, that's, yes. that's correct. That's the XL file. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Do mm -hmm. we have any comments this time? Um, is there a motion? There's no motion right now. We're just uh, dealing with the documents. On 568? Uh, we're doing both 568 and 537. Move to file 568 then, Mr. Chairman. There's a motion to file 568. Second. And send us back no recommendation. File with, okay. with no recommendation. So your motion is to, uh, uh, to clarify for everybody, file the document and make no recommendation to the full council. I take it back, Mr. Chairman. That's not at all what I want. I'm sorry? I apologize. I, I remove my, uh, remove my I remove second. my motion. I want us to have a long conversation about this. Okay. Uh, so, but I'm not going to move to approve it. I'm not going to move that we recommend to approve it to ourselves. If someone wants to make that motion, I'd open that, or you could open that up. We don't need a motion to discuss the document. It's on the agenda, so we can discuss it without a motion at this time. Okay, but don't we need to m make a recommendation to ourselves as eventually? A yes, but we don't need to, okay. we don't need a motion to discuss the documents right okay. now. So, if you'd like to discuss it. Okay, great. I'll start the bidding. Um, I had a great conversation with the chief of police this morning. We had breakfast, and he, uh, he helped me, f he framed something up for me that I, all of us struggle with and have for a long time, and it's about the challenge of separating the issue of pay and benefits from the city employees, the human beings that receive those pay and benefits. It's hard to have a frank, honest talk about the numbers and how they affect our taxpayers without it sounding like we're mad at or don't respect the city employees. So let me be clear. Our city employees are hardworking Americans that are dedicated to serving this city. Um, they are part of a compensation system that's older than most of them are, that they didn't have a hand in creating, uh, they don't perpetuate, uh, and it's not their fault. Uh, it's broken, and that's not their fault. It isn't about them, the human beings, but we do have to have a conversation about the financial reward system that has become so uneven between the employees and the taxpayers that it's bred some level of public resentment toward public employees. Uh, and that robs the employees of their dignity, and that's not right. It's made taxpayers so cynical that now a public employee sometimes is made to feel a little disrespected and a little underappreciated, and they've done nothing to deserve that. It's the compensation system under which they operate that ought to be derided. Um, and, and that helps me transition into what I want to talk about, which is the luxury retirement programs that are available in the city of Sheboygan that are worthy, they're golden parachutes worthy of Point a of Wall order, Street CEO. I believe that's the state of Wisconsin. The retirement system is the Wisconsin retirement system, yes, not the and city of Sheboygan th retirement system. Thank you, system. Mr. President, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come around to that. I appreciate you pointing that out. Um, so our current city employees contribute nothing to their own retirement. Um, but when they retire, if you're a, a, 
if you're in $50,000 a year when you retire, and that's what you retire on, um, you will take home a million, $1.25 million in cash over the remainder of your expected lifetime from the city. And, uh, and if you retire at a senior level, uh, like a director, uh, you're very likely to take home $2.5 million in cash over the 25 years or so you will live, uh, and $500,000 in medical benefits you will use for having contributed nothing except perhaps a little bit to your medical care. Uh, and so that is a, a very good deal. Um, and so that uh, every city employee is getting twice as much in pay and benefits over their lifetime than really what they were kind of hired to get um, because they contribute nothing to their own retirement. And so getting back to what Chief Domogolsky helped me see this morning, um, it's hard to have this conversation about the compensation and not get caught up in, in who we're talking about, and I don't want that to be the issue. Um, but I want to illustrate why it seems unfair to the taxpayers. Um, these city employees would never do this. Matt Walsh, who's the, uh, the head of the police uh, uh, union, he would never go to my neighbor, Joyce Fannis, who's retired. She's 80 years old and living on a fixed income, but she worked her whole life and saved her money, and she's living on that retirement. Matt Walsh would never go bang on her door. She lives on Broughton Drive. Never bang on her door and say, um, Mrs. Fannis, uh, we just had a bunch of retirements from the police department, and they didn't pay anything for their retirement, um, and, and they've retired, so now we've got to start paying them, and it's your turn, and I need about 500 bucks. Will you give that to me? And, and oh, by the way, do you know Simon and Ellie Katchke? They're always out during the day doing USO stuff, and I can't find them right now. Um, will they be home at night? Because I'll go get them at night or in the morning, whenever it's better for them, but they owe 500 bucks too. Um, he would never do that, but the compensation system he operates under does exactly that. They contribute nothing, and they go to our retirees and say, cough up your money to support your own retirement and the retirement of our city employees. Um, and I, I was glad, uh, it's interesting that, uh, <laughs> well, and Tom Pitch is another great example. He takes great care of his body. He, I see him at the YMCA all the time. He's gonna live a long time after retirement. Uh, and he would never go to my neighbor, Pat, uh, Pat Kevin, who lives at uh, Fourth and Ontario, he'd never knock on her door and say, hey, Pat, you're going to retire in a few years. I'm going to retire in a few years. I sure hope you're saving your pennies uh, because you're going to pay for my retirement and your retirement. Are you doing that for me? He'd never do that, but the system he operates under, and he's, he's a president of his union, he propagates that system. And thirdly, um, and lastly, I, I, it was interesting to hear Chase talk about his family because that's important. Chase Longmiller is a great, dedicated servant, served our country in the Air Force. He would never come to my house and knock on my door and say, Alderman Bach, how you doing? I need to talk to your two-year-old. I have a picture of my two-year-old, again, to help personalize this issue. That's my two-year-old. Uh, and I'm sure his is just as adorable. He would never say to my two-year-old, hi, Finley, I'm Fireman Chase. And when you're done with college, I'm going to want to retire in about 20 years. I hope you're really paying attention in school today. Uh, and I hope you get a really good education and a great job because when you are buying your first home, you're going to be paying for my retirement as well as your daily expenses uh, because I want to retire about the time you're getting out of college. He would never do that because he's an honorable guy. Uh, and he'd probably say to my daughter, oh, and will you tell my kid she's going to have to pay my, my retirement too because I don't want to have to tell her that. Uh, and by the way, will you go to <coughs> kinder care on the south side and tell all those two-year-olds that they're going to be paying for my retirement that I didn't want to contribute to? Um, and the state didn't make me contribute to. Let me put it that way. Um, so, there's no dignity in that, and there's no fairness in that. These city employees contribute nothing to their own retirement, and uh, Alderman Wongerman shared with me this morning, he used to work uh, in an environment where he paid half of his retirement. He contributed 7%, the city contributed 7%, and that was a few 20, 25 years ago. Um, he also worked in an environment where he paid 40% of his health care, and citizens paid 60% of his health care. Uh, and, and so that's, given the lens, the perspective of time, in 25 years, that's why none of these directors can afford their employees anymore. The reason we can't get work done is because city employees earn so much more now than they ever did. And that's all sanctioned by the state, and it's all part of a, a system that isn't the employee's fault, but it's a system that's there nonetheless. Uh, and so finally, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the indulgence, here's what I'm proposing tonight that would help with this document, help get my vote on this document, is that um, let's restore the dignity back to the city employees so that citizens can look at them with pride because they're, they're contributing to their own future. Let's restore fairness to that compensation system. And I encourage our union leaders to lead that change. I want you to go to your state bodies and demand that future negotiations happen in public. 
because it's because these negotiations happen behind closed doors that these things that don't really feel very good can get passed. Everything else we do in city government happens in public. Negotiations happen in private and it shouldn't be that way. Um, and someone has to be first and Sheboygan should be first. And this is gonna take courage. But I'm not talking the kind of courage it takes to stand in front of soldiers uh, and protest the Vietnam War. I'm not talking about the kind of courage it takes to sit in the front seat of a bus if you're black or a lunch counter if you're black. I'm not even talking that kind of courage. I'm not even talking the kind of courage it takes uh, to walk into a burning building or come between a citizen and a guy with a gun. You guys already have that courage. I encourage you to have the courage to go to your state and say, it's robbing us of our dignity, we're losing face with our taxpayers, and it's not fair to them, and we want to be the city that turns that around. And in those open negotiations that you help create, and if they say, no way, you can't do it, I encourage you to come back to Sheboygan and do it anyway. Do it anyway. Have that kind of courage. And in those open negotiations, I encourage you to take us back to a time when uh, city police uh, worked. What was it you told me, uh, Alderman Wangaman? City employees used to work fire, used to work six on, three off, six on, two off. And now they're down to five on, three off. Uh, so they're working one less day every, every cycle than they did 20 years ago. That's why, we can, that's why the directors can't get anything done because they can't afford the employees they've got. So I would urge, uh, and I've got, I've got the contact information for the, uh, the union leaders here. I figure if our number is out in the public, I think that the union leaders' numbers ought to be able to be contacted by the citizens. So if you think what I'm saying is a good idea, citizens of Sheboygan, I encourage you to reach out to the union presidents and tell them to restore dignity to uh, our city employees and fairness to the compensation system. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Alderman Bauck. Um, I ask the Alderman and the committee to please um, direct your comments to the committee, not to the public. Uh, it's proper decorum for the committees to discuss amongst ourselves. Will do, Mr. Chairman. Um, next in order, uh, this is point of order. I had to have uh, Alderman uh, Hammond. <coughs> it's actually Alderman Bourne, sorry. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chief, I got a question on the information that was released that uh, released at Monday night's council meeting uh, as an addendum to the uh, article, uh, the, uh, the uh, resolution that Alderman Hanna brought in, and I'm having trouble locating it right here. But I guess my question is, the funding that you found in your budget <coughs> last Thursday or whenever that meeting took place, if you would have looked in March for that funding in your budget, was it there then or a good portion of it there then? A good portion of it was there, but because in March when we were talking about this, we were talking of a May 1st hiring date because we are now looking at July or August. Mm -hmm. The expense is much less, so hence the money is there. Okay, I guess my follow-up question then is, if there was money in your budget without a, without a budget transfer and we, we were not made aware of this money in your budget that you found until last Monday night, if there was money in your budget to carry us over and hopefully, my God, we'd have made a decision on what we were gonna do with hiring your people by this time. But I guess my question is, if there was money in your budget, why did you, why did you close Station 5? Why didn't you use some of that money to keep that station open longer? And hopefully, we would have made a decision by this time. But I have a real problem uh, when there's money in your budget that you did not keep that fire station open. Uh, pretty soon, if, uh, if we can continue with the rolling blackouts, Myself, Alderman Heidemann, and Alderman Rindfleisch, and Alderman Hanna, all of the phone calls we're getting are going to shift over to the north side. But it wasn't necessary because of the money that you had in, that, in your existing budget to close that station. And, and you, know, I, I, you know, with all due respect, I hope that wasn't a political decision to, to, stir up, to stir up things on the south side. You should have not have closed that station because you had money to keep it open. And I resent it very strongly that you closed that station because us aldermen are the ones that are hearing about it. Thank you. First of all, um, at a committee meeting, you raised your hand and said, go ahead and close my station. I voted to keep it open. I voted to keep it open. Find the record. Go ahead, uh, I'm sorry. Let's have proper decorum here, please, and allow people to speak one at a time. Secondly, part of the savings that is now in my budget that allows us to be able to hire either in July or August was attained by closing that station. There's savings that went back into my budget in the salaries account because I'm not paying people 
that are there that is now available. Secondly, all the monies that are available are in the salary account. They're not in the overtime account. If I were to pay it overtime, to keep that station open, it, would have, it wouldn't have lasted as long as straight salary time. It's eaten up at time and a half. So that's the reason it was closed. Okay, Alderman Hanna. Well, thank you. Um, I'm gonna stand up too, I don't like to sit down. <laughs> um, I agree 100% with Alderman Balk. I he think he is dead on uh, that the stranglehold that WRS has on us is the dilemma. <laughs> Um, and I do challenge all the unions uh, in future negotiations to look at making a significant contribution to WRS. Uh, and I do ask that councilmen uh, please communicate this with our state legislators. Uh, this is a stranglehold. This is why if you look at every single department with, with revenues and expenditures, very quickly, that line turns ugly. And that line turns ugly for the most part because of the retirement benefits. Um, there's incidental stuff going on, but it's noise compared to the contribution of the WRS. My only um, disagreement with Alderman Bauk uh, is the life expectancy of, of, uh, of the head of the DPW union, despite <laughs> him going to the YMCA. I don't think you can actuarially make that assumption. Thank you. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, I think we can all stipulate that the state system with uh, mediation arbitration and the WRS uh, is broken and, stink and stinks. I don't need to uh, talk about Mr. Longmiller's children or any of that. I think we can all stipulate from the taxpayer standpoint, it's rotten. And I think actually, in all due respect, Alderman Bauck, I think I know it's a little more rotten than you do. Uh, I spent 150 hours in negotiations this last time around. Uh, if others had a, had a uh, problem with, with doing this, they were welcome to do that too. They chose not to. And, uh, and Alderperson Kittleson spent a great deal of time uh, in those negotiations. Joe Heideman joined you. And, and Alderperson Heideman at the very end as well, uh, when he became chairman of Salary and Grievance. It stinks. And, uh, and any change you're going to see, just so the public understands the reality of the situation, because after 150 hours of screaming into your pillow in the middle of the night, after sitting in those meetings, you get educated. And it's not a pretty education. It's, uh, it, it's an education to uh, how naive we all are when we step into those negotiations, myself included. And I think it is... Although the discussion was to not make it personal, I think it became actually down to the individual, personalized. Um, there is not an employee, a public employee in the state of Wisconsin, with the exception of Milwaukee County, that pays a nickel into WRS. I know it has to start somewhere. I would love for it to start here. But that's where the naive part comes in, and I'm talking about myself, in those negotiations. So if anybody doesn't think that was brought up and talked about during those times, uh, you're wrong. If, uh, however, you then have to say, you're going to do it anyway, because we're going to put it in our final proposal, best and final offer, after 150 hours of negotiations, which took me away from my family, too. Uh, some of the family talks that you're talking about. And you're going to say, this is going to be our best and final. Let's go to mediation arbitration, which is phase two, which hasn't been talked about here. And that is, an arbitrator says, here's the offer from the city, here's the offer from the union, can't meld them together. Sorry, the only props I have, I don't have family photos. <laughs> Can't meld them together. You gotta pick one or the other. And because you don't have a comparable, and I'm not just talking about one comparable, you have to have a wave of comparables. We would lose, and we would pay through the nose in that contract. We would lose big. It's just the way it is. And, and uh, the answer to it, lies in Madison. Tommy Thompson removed WRS contributions as some sort of deal that was made. Uh, we didn't bargain it away. It was taken away from us by the state of Wisconsin. The only way you're going to get it back is that same path. 
I assume we've all contacted our state legislatures on it. I have. Uh, sometimes at 3 o'clock in the morning when I was thinking about the negotiations from the previous day, having to be in them by 8 o'clock the next morning, it gives you a little time to play on the computer. I sent it off to him. There's an election time coming up. It's a great time to bring it up. Uh, I, I don't know what more to say except that uh, some of the individuals, whether they're union heads or whatever, and believe me, we had very spirited conversations. And it is in closed session. But I'll tell you what's not in closed session. We had a mediation, we had a, um, uh, a labor grievance mediation two weeks ago. It was very public. I was the only alderman there through the whole time. Those are very public. Come to it. Roll up the sleeves, get involved, do it. But we could have talked till we were blue in the face about we want a 50% contribution, a 20% contribution, a nickel. The reality was you weren't going to go anywhere because you didn't have any comps. And I'm not talking about one comp, the city of Sheboygan. But I do believe this. I do believe that the unions in the next round, now I'm not just talking about city, I'm talking statewide, in the next round of negotiations, you will see an, a, a contribution, a wave of that thought come through the state of Wisconsin. I have some reason to believe that, and I do believe it, that that's going to be the case. But wait till that wave comes. It's going to be a trickle. You're going to talk about 1.5%. You're going to talk about incrementalism, because that's how we got to this point, by the way, is incrementalism. To go from zero, from 50% way back when, to zero now, back to 50%, will take longer than it took to get to zero. That's the reality. And if we're talking about budget issues of today, we can't bank on having uh, the Sheboygan Union stand up and do that. It's just, I'd love it. Don't get me wrong, I'd love it. It's just not reality. And we have a budget to balance by December 31st this year. And I think it's great education and all that kind of stuff, but people must understand the process, the mediation arbitration process, and uh, the inference, planned or not, or um, intended or not, that maybe we didn't do a good job in negotiations. I, I, I guess I take a little offense at that based on, on the playing field that's across the state of Wisconsin. Mr. Chairman. Um, we have Alderman Bourne next to you, just, if you would, please. Just to follow up, uh, Chief, on, and follow up what I had said before, with this additional money <coughs> that you found in the budget, are you prepared to open up station number five in a couple days? Your discretion, it's your, it's your budget, it doesn't take a, a budget transfer, I believe. Are you prepared to open up the station in the interim period until we can get something done here? No, I don't have the people unless you approve the hiring of four people. I need people to put in the station. Uh, what about paying some of your existing people uh, overtime out of this money you just found to keep to get it open? It's Instead of getting five months of keeping the station open, that'll get you three. Well, we may be able to come to an agreement here, hopefully, that gets you your four people if there's some things that go along with that. But the, the calls I'm getting from, this, from my constituents, and I'm sure the other Southside aldermen, is they want that station open. And if you've got the money to do it, I would appreciate it if you do it on an interim basis, even if you have to pay some overtime, and hopefully we'll make a decision Monday night if the mayor calls a meeting or the next council meeting that we're going to make a decision on getting you the four people, but we're going to have to come to an agreement to that, of course, with maybe some stipulations on how we can do that. It's going to have to be a partnership of everybody involved, but I would like that station open if you can do it. And again, it's your discretion, it's your money in the budget. It's not a budget transfer. So I think the citizens over in my district and Alderman Rinfleisch's district and Heidem and Hammond would like to get that station open even if we can do it on an, on an interim basis and hopefully eventually get you the people. But I'd like to get it open. Trust me, there's nobody that wants that station open more than I do. Um, if I do that, I don't have the money if you decide in a month to hire the four people, then it, it, then it will take a budget transfer. Mm -hmm. You might have the votes for it, I, it you know, I, uh, you know depending, on, depending, on, depending on what we can agree upon. And, but again, it's going to have to be a partnership. But, Chief, I would vote to hire four people, five people right now if we had, and I don't want to negotiate contracts here. But if this was a partnership with the union where we got long-term, not band-aid concessions for one year to fund these people as we go forward, I'd hire them in a heartbeat. But you, and I, I agree. You're talking about not having band-aid fixes. That's what opening the station tomorrow with overtime is. That's a band-aid fix. I would prefer to look long-term 
if you look at the proposals I've put out, it's not how do we fund those four people for the rest of this year. I've looked into next year. How do we fund it next year? It, I, I can't look at, okay, let's open it up next Monday and everything's fine again and then everybody forgets about this. This is long-term planning we have to do here. And, I, and fixing short-term fixes with overtime is not the answer. You do not get the bang for the dollar. I guess my fear, Chief, was is that if we would have gone to hire, we would have agreed to hire the four people, the discussion would have been over, too, about long-term fixes. That was my fear. Not in my book it wouldn't have been. I, I mean, I agree with Alderman Bauk also. There's a problem with the Wisconsin retirement system. I've been chastised for the contracts I negotiated as union president. I'm proud of what I did as union president. I was a good union president. Now I'm on the other side. I've made contacts with people in the state that I had before to try to fix this problem. They realize it also, but it takes time. And the place to fix it is not here grandstanding. It's in negotiation rooms. Is it at contract opening time? Yes. Maybe it is in between that time because we've got a problem now. But that's the way you fix it, by sitting down as intelligent human beings and, try, and identifying the problem and coming up with a solution amongst us. Everybody realizes there's a problem. We need to fix it. Alderman Bowers. Yes, I concur with uh, Alderman uh, Bulk's thinking here. Alderman Gish, is there anything in the state constitution, not the constitution, but what Tommy Thompson uh, negotiated? Can the workers contribute on, upon themselves? Is there anything that would limit them to not contribute to their pension? And I have no idea. Huh? So they, uh, technically, they could. Uh, I know. I know nothing about the contractual details or the statutory details of the Wisconsin retirement service. So it's possible that they could do that. No, I'm not saying it's possible. I'm saying oh, I don't I'm know anything it's, about I'm it. I'm saying it's possible. <laughs> if they want to do it, they could do it. Alderman Hammond. Thank Next, you. Right here. Mr. Chair. Do you have the information? I'm sorry. I thought I was after Alderman. Moore, I'm just going right by the lights. I'll sorry. yield. Okay. He can go. Did you? It automatically goes the to lights, the next if person. If you turn them off, the lights automatically flash in the next one. That yeah. So I'm just going in the order of the lights go through. Yeah, they do. So, so who's up? Um, and unless, though, you happen to be Alderman Clayunis, I think that's actually Hammond. So. No, it was me. He's actually. All right. Who's Surik? I'm actually, actually, actually born. <laughs> you're Surik. That would be me, then. Huh? We, we, he, would, he was Surik. Right. Surik. I'll solve Oh, you're born. Somebody's <laughs> got to label that thing. <laughs> I know what they are. Who's up? Uh, uh, you're up. Yeah, actually, you're uh, Alderman born on this board. Yeah, you're Heidemann. I'm I'm Heidemann, yeah. <laughs> I'm flattered, and he's not even here. I guess I'd just like to make a comment. I and mean, I agree with many of the comments that were made today by Alderman Bauk, Alderman Bourne. But really, we have two issues here. We have a short-term issue and a long-term issue. The short-term issue is we've got half of the city unprotected right now. Okay? You've got three fire departments on the north side, one fire department that takes care of the central city, and the entire south side, which is divided by a railroad that at one, any point can bring up to 75 cars through and block off from the power plant all the way past 18th Street. I have a problem with that. The long-term challenge we face is what do we do with the fire department going forward? The comment keeps being made if we hire these four firefighters that we're stuck with them for life. I'll give you that. But in the next five years, we have slated 13 firefighters that are going to probably retire. Don't quote me on that number. Some might work a little longer. So may have a few more retirements. So this conversation is going to come up over and over about staffing levels at the Sheboygan Fire Department. This is not done in a vacuum in an absolute. We need to look at this as two separate issues. And the f number one issue is get the protection needed on the south side that the taxpayers deserve and have paid for. The second issue as a council, we need to start stepping up and pr showing some leadership and put together, along with the chief, a plan of what this fire department is going to look like five years from now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The next flashing light is Alderman Hanna. Thank you. Um, I concur with, the, with Alderman Hammond uh, that this gets broken down into a short-term and long-term situation. But I want to publicly uh, recognize that the fire department next year is willing to give back their raises to help. But I do challenge them 
when contract negotiations come out, I challenge them to take the lead on making contributions to the WRS. I challenge them to set the standard in the state uh, and, and be one of the first unions that steps up and, and challenges that. Don and I work in a system where we fund 100% of our retirement. We're out of that same world that, that Alderman Valk is out of and the same world that uh, Alderperson Bourne was out of and, and, and most of us are. Um, so I just, I'd like this to be short term and long term. I think that's important. I certainly hope that the fireman union uh, takes the lead, sets the standard. I'd love to be recognized as the first city that did this. Thank you, Alderman Hanna. Now I have two lights flashing, one for Alderman Bourne, one for Bauk, but Bauk is the second one over. Uh, Alderman Mosby, are you in? No. Okay, so I'm gonna go with Alderman Bauk, it's you. <laughs> it's actually you on this thing. So. And uh, uh, let me say unequivocally to, Chair, to President Gisha that I don't know anyone who's been more of a, an advocate for him and uh, Alderperson Hannah in social situations and in public situations of saying, this city has no idea the debt it owes to those two gentlemen. I've been very public, as much as I can be as one person in saying that. Um, they have done things in the past two or three years that go above and beyond anything uh, that I have seen anyone else do, myself included. So let me uh, just do as much as I can right now to say, please don't infer anything about how you handled those negotiations from my comments at all. You made a heroic effort. Uh, and, and you stuck with it, and, and you saw it through to conclusion, and you got some good outcomes. My, my conversation tonight, my long-winded conversation, has nothing to do with you and your leadership. Um, uh, now, your comments, your very gentle admonition that I may be naive and uninformed on things, I appreciate the gen gentleness with I said with I you. was. Oh, well, well okay. And, and so I'm just going to uh, say that if you were trying to gently scold me, I appreciate you for doing it gently. And two, I'll admit, um, I, I wouldn't call it naive, I would call it idealistic. And at some point we have to take um, principled stands, not that you weren't taking a principled stand, but that great change that is necessary in this world doesn't happen when we do short-term things forever. At some point we have to stand up against great change and say now is the time and I am the one. And I have 10 or 12 months left to serve as an older person and I feel compelled that this is the cause of my next 10 or 11 months. I will oppose anything that has to do uh, with promoting the long-term system. And I know it's controlled at the state, but here's, um, here's where I'm going with that. I am done making my, making Joyce Fannis and Pat Kevin and Simon and Ellie Katschke bow down to the tyranny that Madison has put on us. I'm done. I don't have the stomach for it anymore. And so, uh, and, and I, I empathize with uh, Alderperson Hammond's comments. If I were an Alderperson on the South Side, He's got direct constituents to manage. Of course I'd be talking about opening up that south side. But we protected this city without a south side, uh, without a south side station for a long time. So I, 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 I'm not sure I totally agree with the fact that we're endangering half the city by not voting for four, uh, four fire persons. Um, and I don't think that we've ever made great change in this country by continuing to put band-aids over things that isolate people from the effect of the long-term issue. And in this case, the long-term issue is that onerous pay and compensation system. And by covering it over, by hiring four more people to band-aid it right now, that insulates our taxpayers from the pain they should be feeling. They need to feel the pain of, of wrestling. It'll get more people engaged. It'll get more people to, um, to grievance meetings where someone brings a, grieve, a $40 grievance, somebody brings a $40 grievance to salary and grievance and costs thousands of city dollars to gripe a $40 grievance. And, and until the citizens feel that pain, they're not gonna get involved and come to those kind of committee meetings and they're not gonna write Terry and Joe in Madison and they're not gonna vote for people who will go to Madison and Washington in November and change this. And so um, I appreciate uh, all of what President Gisha said, I can only do what my conscience calls on me to do for my next 10 months, and that is to oppose anything that supports the continuation of a system that I think uh, takes the dignity away from our city employees and is unfair to our taxpayers. Including policemen? Uh, I, I'm, I'm Including sorry. policemen? Like what? I, I missed what? 
We were talking about hiring. There was discussion here earlier with the police chief of hiring three policemen. Would that follow? Would your commitment also follow through to hiring policemen? Absolutely. Just checking. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Helen Bourne, are you in? Uh, <laughs> I do, ha I do I mean? have something, but I, I, I didn't have the right well, there's push. A, <laughs> somebody on this side of the room been punched in. Outside of you, you're next on it. I Thank believe you. after the mayor. It All great conversation. Yeah, well, uh, okay. Let's not forget while we're here to try and find ways <coughs> to lower our budget, find it somewhere else. I have put in countless, endless hours researching outside of Wisconsin, okay? I have spoke to about 15 to 18 different fire chiefs across the nation, and I have just a short list of the, some of the communities that have uh, larger square mileage, more population, less firefighters, more average or more res total incident calls, and about the same um, average response time. Uh, first big one here is Coloran Township, Ohio. They have 44 square miles. They have 67,000 people in their population. Okay, they have 53 full-time firefighters and they actually have 110 part-time firefighters. They also have the EMS as well. Okay, they have the ambulance service. Um, last year they have five stations, same as us. They had 9,195 calls. Okay, and their average response time is five, five minutes, 21 seconds. Okay, Dearborn Heights, Michigan, closest to us that we can get, 13 square miles, 59,000 people. They have 51 full-time firefighter paramedics. They have three fire stations. They responded to 6,299 calls, and their average response time is four minutes and 46 seconds. Loveland, Colorado, 31 square miles, 62,000 population, 58 full-time firefighters, and 80 volunteers. They respond from four stations. They have 5,513 calls last year with an average response time of five minutes, 19 seconds. Wyoming, Michigan, 25 square miles, 70,000 population. This is an extreme I wouldn't compare to, but I wanted to put it on here. They have 24 full-time firefighters and 27 paid on call. They have three fire stations and responded to 5,109 calls with an average response time, listen to this one, five minutes, nine seconds with those 24 firefighters. Eden Prairie, Minnesota, I won't use that, that's too many volunteers. Uh, West Des Moines, Iowa, 34 square miles, 58,000 people, 45 full-time firefighters. Four fire stations, and this is close to our, our response to total incidents, 2,930, and their average response time is 519. Um, Maple Grove, Minnesota, um, and all these fire chiefs I spent a lot of time on the phone with, um, many conversations with them actually over time, but Maple Grove, Minnesota, 36 square miles, 64,000 people. They only have four full-time firefighters. They have 83 paid on-call firefighters. They have five fire stations. Their average, granted, they only did fire, they had 880 structure fires, but their average response time was five minutes and 21 seconds. And here's one I had to put in here, Boulder, Colorado, because of the population density, okay? They have 24 square miles, twice our size, but more than twice their population. They have over 104,000 people in that time, in that city. They have 104 full-time firefighters, and they have seven stations. But they also went on 9,730 calls, and still, their average response time is five minutes and 21 seconds. So looking at these, this is just a handful I wanted to put out, is what, they're not putting their public, at, their public safety at risk. They haven't had any concerns, people aren't dying, babies aren't burning. So why can't we look outside the box to try and fix the long-term plan, or actually lack of long-term plan the city has? We need to look outside to try and find ways and not add more burden to us, try and relieve some of the burden and look outside. I mean, it's just a simple question. That's why we're here tonight, is to try and find solutions. How do they do it? I asked everyone <laughs> these fire chiefs if I could sponsor a trip for them to come here and, and talk, and they all said, sure, they'll vacation to Sheboygan, Wisconsin. But I mean, this is just something we need to look at. These are, these are facts. You can't argue with the facts. This is what's done across the nation. I didn't want to do the East Coast because they go by private fire departments. So if you look at the East Coast, let's not even compare to that. We're not going there. But these are places in the Midwest that do it day in and day out, and there's not a huge safety concern. So how can we compare and get to what they're going? That's where the city needs to go. Uh, again, without being provided that information prior to this meeting, I could have done a little research on it. I am familiar with about half of those cities that you mentioned. Um, in the ones that I'm familiar with, uh, they are the complete opposite of Sheboygan, in that they are a suburb of a larger city, in that 
they have available to them full-time fire departments to respond right away to help them, where we are the opposite. A better comparison to some of those cities would be the town of Sheboygan that has us right next door to them. In regards to the population density on a lot of those that I looked at where they're, they cover way more uh, square miles than what we do and the population is similar, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. That's also similar to the town of Sheboygan in that they have one acre suburb type lots. They don't have Superior Avenue where, the house, where you can reach out and touch your neighbor, where you're worried about an exposure. They don't have the business community like uh, we have downtown where you have buildings right next to each other. Um, I don't know what their industry base is. A lot of suburbs uh, tend not to have industrial parks. So without researching that, um, you know, it's hard for me to comment on that. Uh, if you do look at, um, I think it was, Scenario E, whatever the three stations was, that's a paid on call scenario that's in there for you to look at. Okay. Um, actually, I did do the research on the uh, population density in some of those, and also in Sheboygan, you also got to remember um, one household, take me with five children, my household, seven people. You're going to population density within those close per parameters is fine, but the, uh, every single one of these also has industrial parks, has big downtowns. Um, you look at Dearborn Heights, yep, you're right, that's a suburb. Well, they also have one of the Midwest National Museums in Dearborn Heights. I mean, these, all these communities here have more than what we have. They do twice what we do with less. That's what I was just looking at, and how can they do it, respond more, do more, have more, even their, their tax base is more with less. Their budgets are all less than ours too, by the way. Uh, actually, one of those is higher. <laughs> You're right, Boulder. Yeah. You're right. And, uh, the ones that I've called and researched on that list started out as volunteer departments and are moving our way because they can't get enough volunteer firefighters because of their volume of calls. Uh, so it's not like they were a paid department and looking to go the other way. They're actually coming this way because as they grow. Sure, and within the state of, Shibu of Wisconsin, La Crosse right now, yeah, it has come to my knowledge that they're actually going to a 100% volunteer fire service. That is what's coming up in La Crosse right now. That has not been decided. That is not that's accurate. Been, it's been looked at, but that's not what's happening. It's Mayor Ryan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I, th I think the thing we need to look at here this evening is, you know, this, this issue will not be solved in the next month, okay? We have Alderman Boren, we have Alderman Hammond uh, wanting that Southside Fire Station open. I believe that the council needs to look at the short-term fix, and it is only a short-term fix, believe me, but also the council needs to be dedicated to finding a long-term solution. If you look at the numbers in scenario D, was it, keeping the opening five stations and keeping the ambulance and, and, and possibly expanding the ambulance service. Um, that gets us through this year, the rest of 2010, and the gap is not that wide in 2011, especially if the union gives back that one and a half percent and one and a half percent. Right. That gives 18 months to figure out what that long-term solution is. 18 months. The council will have 18 months to come up with a solution of which we will come up with a solution, a long-term solution, not just a Band-Aid fix. Doing this, is only, it's only, it is a Band-Aid. That's all it is. It's a Band-Aid. But we cannot continue to debate an issue and take no action. The council can't do that. I mean, you guys can't do that. We've, there's got to be action taken. Um, I can tell you as the mayor, and I will be the mayor for the next 18 months, um, we will come up with a solution in the next 18 months, a viable, long-term economic solution for the fire department. But in order to do that, we have to at least know where we're at today. And debating a subject to death doesn't solve the short-term problem. So I believe the council needs to make a decision. Um, if you're, we're not going to get anybody buying into WRS uh, in the next couple months. It's not going to happen. It's not reality, as Alderman Gisha said, President Gisha. In the long term, uh, I think the entire model needs to be looked at. It does, obviously, because it's not economically viable for the long term. For the next 18 months, it can be a Band-Aid. 
get the fire stations open, keep the ambulance operating for the next 18 months, gives us 18 months to figure out a solution, a long-term economically viable solution. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Oliver Hanna. I'd like to cut that to 12 months because I want Corey to be part of the final solution. So let's keep it a 12 month. I don't know if you're allowed to, to use final solution. That's not a good term there. Five, five stations. I'm going to make a recommendation uh, that we keep, we go with five stations in ambulance service with 73 firefighters. All of them born, you're right. It's a band aid. Um, and we could, we could argue to death, but the people on the south side need protection. It rolls up to my district and all the person Bowers district next. Uh, so I'm going to put forward a, a motion. I so, certainly hope somebody will second it. Second. Clarify the motion is to uh, approve scenario D. scenario D, which is to keep the five stations um, and the ambulance service, I believe, is part of the solution according to the report. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, we take any action on the document 537 to file as well? We haven't discussed it yet. We haven't talked about it. I'm sorry? That was uh, are we ready for discussion on the motion? <clears throat> oh, we need a second on that. I'm sorry. Oh, I, didn't, I thought second. we did get one. Okay. Motion has been made in second. Absolutely. Okay. Um, we have people punched in from the previous discussions. I'm going to clear the board. Uh, punch in if you want to talk about the motion at this time. Mr. Chairman, if I could add before you begin discussion. Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead. Uh, one of the comments that was made before is that we survived a long time without that fifth fire station on the south side. We survived that time. That was during the period when we had 20 more firefighters. There were eight firefighters and two fire apparatus in that fire station. Now there are four firefighters there. So there is a definite reduction in the amount of protection that is there now compared to what was there prior to that station being built. When we built that station number five, we didn't hire any additional people. What we really did was they recognized that we do have too many firefighters on the north side compared to the south, and we moved Chief. people south. Chief, if I can clarify, you only have four firefighters at the Mead Avenue fire station, is right. what you're saying? Yes. Okay. I have cleared the board, so discussion on the uh, motion. Uh, the, the other comment I'd like to make is if you read my operational analysis, if scenario C with four stations is the one that you do like, scenario D gets you there in the short term. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Alderman Radke? Yeah, I'm just curious. We're talking short term and long term here, but it seems to me like the item B here that we're voting on is a long term solution versus a short term solution. Am I incorrect? I'm just asking. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Alderman Radke, uh, the average amount of retires we have every year is three. So when people say, you know, if we hire these three people or these four people, we have them for 30 years or 25 years or whatever, that's true. You maybe have that body, but you have that opportunity to reduce staff at a later time through attrition due to the fact that we have three retirees a year on an average ongoing basis. To follow up? Yeah, just a just a follow up. I'm sorry, Alma Hanna, I I misspoke. It's actually over here. <laughs> you looked at it. I did. I did. I didn't look down, and there's it a red light. <laughs> <laughs> it was a head fake. Hammond. I didn't punch in. I guess I think I think <laughs> it's me. Um, I I thought you were Clay Eunice. I used to, I used to be over there. That's Clay Eunice. I did. I used to move. I used to sit on the end last council year. Now I moved here, but the board hasn't been changed yet. So. <laughs> All right, then I shall be born. Then you're up. Thank you very much. Uh, in uh, discussion of the motion, I just want to share with you an email that I got from former director Terry Hansen on Monday morning at 6.21 a.m. Uh, he said, I just wanted you both, and I was CC'd on this uh, email, it went to uh, uh, Alderman Balk, uh, I just wanted you both, I just wanted you both to be aware that the resolution that, that has been submitted for tonight in regards to the firefighters does not have any financial component to the resolution. And then in parentheses, he says, last I saw. If I were still there, I would express the importance of knowing what needs to be changed in the budget this year to accommodate the firefighters. In addition, in six months, you may or may not be able to afford having 
the same four firefighters on the payroll. Please talk to Nancy on the finance department's take on the resolution if there should be a budget amendment on the resolution. Otherwise, there could be the possibility of authorizing the hiring but not being able to fund the positions. And then again in parentheses <coughs> he says, which has happened in the past with labor negotiation services. So I just wanted to pass that along to you that our, and I guess I would share the concern too, again, before talking about Band-Aids, authorizing to hire these four firefighters for the rest of the year. <clears throat> and I think the, uh, the budget deficit for next year conservatively has been thrown around at $1.2 million. In talking with Nancy Buss a, a couple of days ago, it could be potentially much worse than that. So my concern would be hiring the four people and then not being, and then having to lay them off in January. And then this is, again, I think a reason why uh, we have to, in the next couple months before the end of the year, try to come to some agreement with our bargaining unit on concessions on how we're going to be able to afford these four firefighters next year and in the coming years. And uh, I think that's very important. Uh, it, it, we have to be able to afford them next year and the next few years after that. Uh, if we're going to hire him now. So that's the take I got from uh, former uh, finance director's email, and I'm just passing it along. And Thank I you. did sit down with Nancy on, I believe it was Monday, sometime during that day, and she did agree that the dollars are in the budget to fund it through the end of the year. Mm -hmm. um, next year, and I don't have that document, it's in uh, my briefcase here. $9,600. Yeah, uh, we're short. Her figures were a little bit different than mine, okay. but it was somewhere between $10,000 and $40,000 short, but I did not include in the firefighter's offer of uh, 90 to 100,000, whatever that amount is, into that amount. Uh, Alderman Rinfleisch, if I could just comment on that. Uh, if, if, tell me if I'm right on this, Chief. If the, if the union has agreed to give back the one and a half and the one and a half, which is three, but on the other hand, next year, there are they're going to be reducing their contribution to the health insurance from the current 12 down to 10. Uh, I guess that's a net of one, right? Uh, actually, I didn't include the $79,000 that they gave back this year as a 2%. Um, I did not include that. And I didn't include their offer of next year because <laughs> they're getting a raise next year. They're just giving it back. So that's why I did not include that in my calculations and Nancy agreed that that was correct. So that's what it, that would that's what it would net out by them paying less for their health insurance next year. It still nets out to the figure you had. What was it again? 79,000. 79,000 even though they're going to be paying less for their health insurance next year. That 79,000 is accurate? That was what uh, Director Hansen had given me what their concession was in the contract negotiations this year. On the health uh, that, insurance. We haven't touched that money. Okay. Um, but I was using that money in next year to help fund the four people. But I did not use this most recent offer that uh, they put forward because it hasn't been enacted on at all. Can Alderman Hanna. You were punched in, Alderman Hanna. I didn't mean to. Okay. Can I, can I, can I ask? I just Thank got you, so Mr. excited Chairman. with all the buttons. You know, we were given these new uh, uh, these sheets, uh, Chief. Just you know, just before the meeting here, that was, these were these scenarios were sent to us, and and looking this, can you do a little explanation here? Because I think this, we're looking at three hires now rather than four. Am, am I correct? No, actually, we're we're looking at four hires, okay. but. One is the person that retired on uh, May 6th. That, that money has, was funded and is in the 2010 budget. Okay. But, it's but still I did account for that in, in 2011. And you did sit with Nancy and put these together? These this numbers that I emailed to everybody, and if anybody did not get it, I have hard copies of it. I, I put that, this together with Nancy this afternoon okay. to try to show you what the impact to the taxpayer is for each scenario. Okay. Thank you. Alderman Kath. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Chief Herman, in the budget there was a 70 personnel. We voted on 70 personnel in the budget. And there's 69. If we 
hired the one to go back to the budget of 70, and with the half a million dollar pumper truck, which is replacing three, how far are how far will we get with the, basically the, 70? The rescue percent? pumper concept, and I'm glad you brought that up because I should have mentioned that in my first uh, time I was up here. That's what allowed us to go from the 77 personnel that we had last year down to the 73 that we need to keep um, the five fire stations open. We deleted one staff member, and by purchasing that rescue pumper allowed us to, to not rehire three more people and save those uh, employee costs for forever. But now with lifting the hiring freeze and hiring, hiring four, we'll have 73. Correct. And then another three is actually, we're almost up to... No, no we'll have, if, if you approve hiring the four, it will have 73, which is enough to keep the five stations open. Okay. Alderman Buck. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Just a question. I really thought, we're talking about Band-Aids and long-term, short-term, and when I saw the, uh, the strategic fiscal planning stuff, first on the agenda, Mr. President, I wondered if maybe there wasn't something going on that you guys were going to present as part of that, uh, as part of, hey, hey, here's the long-term picture. Um, here's why you should believe in the short term, because here's what we're looking at. So I wanted to give you a chance. That didn't seem to come up during there, but I wanted to give you a chance to talk about, is there any reason to hope uh, that there might be some different things coming long-term? Well, I appreciate you asking me. However, I'm not the chairman of strategic fiscal planning. Alderman Hanna is. Oh, and if well, he I could speak, I know you're on if he could speak to that, it, I would so, appreciate it. So, okay. He's ready to talk now. Alderman Hanna. Now he buzzes. Now I buzz in. <laughs> um, some of the cities that Alderman Versi brought up, and I won't reveal which ones, um, our mayor is in quite close contact with. Uh, he will be visiting some of those cities. He is going to help push this forward. I hope I'm not breaching any confidence, but he's going to push this forward uh, with some long-term solutions. Uh, so he's getting out there and he's talking to the right people. Uh, so as, a, as an answer, uh, yes, and my goal is before you leave in April. I'm Mayor Ryan. Can you take the chief along? Yes, if I may, and that's why I say um, short-term, long-term. Um, you know, short term is now. Short term is the band aid. Uh, long term, um, we need a. We're going to need a different model, obviously, um, than we're than we're than we presently have. And uh, I, I believe it's something that we need to look at. Something that can be done over time. Uh, something that can be done through attrition. Um, that basically, I think we need to to to, to uh, look elsewhere and think out of the box. And then that's why I can, you know, which I didn't expect Alderman Hanna to. I do have uh, uh, one uh, excursion plan to Minnesota uh, to check out uh, some uh, different operations, uh, which will be happening here in the next couple of weeks. If I could follow up on the comment from Alderman Bout, uh, is from the strategic fiscal planning standpoint. Uh, um, I don't like it and I think it's kind of ugly, but I think it's really necessary. I've never been shy about removing City of Sheboygan employees. I personally have my name on documents that has about 40 of them on the street right now. Uh, proud because it was necessary, not proud from a human standpoint. Uh, if any of those in strategic fiscal planning has committed to having this done before you're out of office, assuming you're going to be out of office, uh, and if those scenarios are taxpayer friendly, logistically acceptable to some level of six minute, I'm not interested in 12 minute response times, I'm not interested in eight minutes personally, I'm interested around the five to six mark, which I think was uh, some of the, most of the benchmarks of Alderman Versi. Uh, whatever plan that comes out of there, if that means less bodies or a different configuration of services, I would vote for it regardless. So the, once you plug it in, it's there for life. I can't speak for anybody but myself, but uh, I think I, I have a history of doing the opposite. Alvin Warren. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, again. Uh, uh, I guess I'm getting to the point where I'm getting closer to voting for this. Uh, what, whatever we vote on tonight uh, is, uh, of course, it's gonna have to be approved by the council whenever our next council meeting is if the mayor chooses to, 
to uh, have one next Monday or the following Monday. But I, it would make it a lot easier for me to vote for this, uh, the short-term thing, and then looking into next year. And again, I'm not here to negotiate contracts, but it certainly would be nice if the union would consider that additional 2% payment in, in next year's contract. For me, that would make it a lot more viable and help you deal, help us deal with that 90,000 bucks you're talking about, Chief. So, you know, by the time our next council meeting comes about, if, the, if our, our labor partners would, would want to consider doing that, at least from my standpoint, it would make it easier me, for me to vote for that. So if we could have some kind of a letter from our bargaining unit that they would, that they would do that next year, it would make it a lot easier for me. So I'm just throwing that out there. All right, all the lights are off. There is a motion on the floor in a second uh, to, approve, or to approve the recommendation to ourselves as uh, full council uh, of the solution to keep the five stations in ambulance service. I'd like uh, to offer an amendment. I would like to amend it to say, to add um, contingent upon receipt of letter from the bargaining unit uh, entered into as a council document regarding uh, regarding concessions. That gives it an opening, Alderman Bourne, if the letter that we have doesn't include what you suggested, for instance, that they have that time period to do, and then we actually have it then coming in as a physical document. It should come in anyway and be tied together, I think, even if the one that's there currently <coughs> Is, is, is that, uh, on, on that? On that, thank you for the amendment. If you need a second, I'll second it. Uh, but uh, I, that would, I think that would make it comfortable enough for me to support this tonight, but I want to see the letter before I vote positive finally at the council meeting, whatever that is. And I'm not stating what the le has to be in that letter. That'll right. have be time for review right. for all aldermen at that time before they make their vote. We have a, an amendment and a second. Any discussion on the amendment? Um, Alderman Bowers, discussion on the amendment? No. All I want to know is we're still including the ambulance? Are That's the, part of the recommendation right now. Ambulance? It's part of the yeah. recommendation right now. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. All right. Okay. Any discussion on the amendment? All in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Need a motion uh, to put to recommend the uh, to ourselves the amended version. I move to. Oh, I'm sorry. Was there a hand? Yeah, I accept yeah. the friendly amendment. What, do, uh, what else do you need from? We need a motion to. Um, I would make a motion uh, to for approve five as amended. stations with the ambulance, 73 firefighters, with a letter of concession uh, delivered to us before we make the final vote of council. Is that acceptable? It's acceptable to me. Is there a second? Second. Motion made and second. Any discussion on the motion? It's me right. this time. <laughs> Warren. I don't have it. I'm just going to start waving instead of hitting the button. <laughs> um, I would also like to add an amendment um, to this that we set a timeline um, for whatever committee or the mayor or somebody to come back to us with a long-term solution. Um, whether we set it at the 1231 deadline, I guess that's up for discussion, but I would like to have a hard, fast deadline when somebody will be coming back or PPNS, Strategic Fiscal Planning, whoever it is, will come back to this, this group or to the council with a solution or with a recommendation for a solution. Mr. Chairman, if we, if we can set that at uh, 1231, that would be great by the end of the year. Um, because, I mean, this is, this is nothing that's going to be uh, obviously uh, uh, decided overnight. Um, but I think we can have a good, solid plan and something that uh, will, will be agreeable to everybody involved, being, uh, being the fire department and, uh, and the council by the end of the year. Is there a second to the second? second. Who's seconding Gisha? Good, good point. Okay, motion made and second to amend uh, our recommendation to ourselves to include a deadline of 1231. Any discussion on that amendment? Um, you're on the amendment or uh, for uh, discussion? It's, it's, uh, I just wanted to mention that if it's, if it's logistically possible, Mayor, when you go on your field trips to the city, I think you should include the chief with them on those visits mm -hmm. if you can, because it would be good to have the professional's uh, opinion on what he thinks is going on in those towns. 
And another thing that I think would be appropriate, if it is appropriate, and I have no way of knowing, and that maybe would be to invite Mr. Longwheeler to go along because he's going to eventually have to have some buy-in in this also. So that's just food for thought, Mayor. Uh, I appreciate that, and uh, I'll take that under consideration. Thank you. Yeah. May I ask yes. a question, please? All right, where is this contingent upon receipt of a letter regarding concessions? Is that my understanding? All right, I mean, that they are just a letter regarding concessions? I would like to keep that, my point was to keep that generic so that to additional it, conversations can take place. To, just to keep it generic so everyone, we understand that. It's just a generic letter regarding concessions. Right. Well, I don't want the letter to be specific. I, I just didn't want to say what the concessions would be. That's right, not our decision. Right, right. But I hinted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did that. Real subtle. Okay. Uh, discussion on the amendment? Hannah? Alderman Hannah? No, I was going to make, I was going to amend my original motion. We need to vote on the <laughs> amendment first okay. to, with the deadline. Any discussion on the amendment? Um, uh, the only thing I guess I would add to that is what committee would be subject to bringing that back to the council, would it be strategic fiscal planning or PPNS? So. Not public works. <laughs> you can <laughs> if I have a light agenda. Um, so I guess I, I kind of almost <coughs> throw that out as as a as a new guy. I'm not sure which committee would be or both would be most uh, advantageous or that would be most advantageous to handle that. So, would the chairman of the strategic fiscal like to make a comment? I think that the mayor should make that call and direct it to the appropriate right. committee. Fair enough. Then okay. 1231 and the committee to be directed by the mayor. Okay. The motion has been made and second to amend. Any other discussion on the amendment? All in favor say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Alderman Hanna? I would like to uh, add a second amendment to my original motion oh, with the hope that this is the last amendment uh, to add the uh, new solution uh, deadline date of 12, th the long-term solution of the <laughs> deadline date of 12-31-2010. Is that correct? That's what, I think that's what I think said. that's contained in the previous. That's the yeah. previous it's amendment. Alderman there. Hammond's motion was. But the, it's the already the in there. Yes. Come on, Julie. Make an amendment. Right. So what is, the, what is the motion that he wants now? The more. What's the amendment now? Okay, the, the amendment is for contingent upon receipt of a letter regarding concessions. I thought that was the last one. Okay, that's but the, that's I'm, the adding the, I'm doing the whole thing. Fi uh, and a long-term plan, uh, uh, just a long-term plan by 1231. And, the, and it will be directed by the committee. Uh, what committee motion. it will go to it will be directed by the mayor. It's already been your motion. Perfect. You That's my forward. motion. Very <laughs> Move along. It was Hannah Gishin and Hammond Ray. What is it, midnight? Uh, and I second that. I'm going. I'm on a roll. We, it's already been seconded. <laughs> no, it's, it's already passed. been passed. It's already been made. <laughs> it's already been passed. It's already been passed. Nope. We're discussing this, this amendment that we've made. already passed. So. Okay. Uh, Alderman Bourne? I was just, when we get around to voting on everything, I would, I would like a roll call vote on the final vote sure. that we recommend to the council, please. Mm -hmm. uh, you want a roll call vote for, for on our this final vote here? For that yeah. final. For the final. Page four. Page three, sorry. On the market share that you have for, if you have 50% of the market share and round trip revenue of 192,415. Um, that number is well overinflated because they were going off of the, the mileage of the six dollars and seventy four cents round trip. Um, that's that's false because on on trip to the hospital that's going to be one hundred percent accurate. Trip back when you're trying to do a round trip, you're going to get about sixty cents on the return trip, not six dollars and seventy four cents. So I mean, it makes it makes a big difference when you keep going for fifty percent of the market share on that many calls. That'll deflate that $192,000 quite a bit. So I'm just wondering if that, obviously it wasn't taken into account. And then the other part of that also was, um, what's the protocol when you go, when you change from a BLS call to an ALS call when you're doing Medicare services? What, at what point you know, does it become an ALS call? Is it injecting an IV, injecting a drug, or what, when does it become an ALS call for the price difference? Uh, there's many different factors. It's just the level of care. Um, that wasn't figured into these. I, I believe this was, this was put together by um, our billing agency and Director Hansen. I really had little input into this. Okay. Other than getting those two together. 
Okay, because that was that just deflates a number that's on there. So I wish, you know, I guess try and get with both of them or Nancy Bus to. I, I would imagine that the majority of them are BLS calls. Okay. Alderman Versi, excuse me. If it's if it's helpful during strategic fiscal planning discussion uh, regarding that whole complete data, we actually discounted the whole thing. It became not part of our decision making process in forwarding this document. Okay. Uh, only because we thought felt that was an initial kick with a billing service who isn't even employed by us yet, with a finance director that was working with them, and it was that type of stuff was new to them too. And then you have the market factors of, of comparison of markets, which we didn't think was valid either. Uh, so we didn't, it was not in consideration. So basically this is a shredder document. That's the way we did it, yeah. <laughs> if that's helpful. I, I, if it ever comes up again, I think all that stuff you had would be appropriate, but it's not part, it wasn't part of our okay. thing. Okay, great. Alderman Hammond. That's me. Oh, I did it again. <laughs> <laughs> For three hours, you will get this. Uh, Chief <laughs> Herman, I, on the, uh, I have a couple, just a couple uh, building thing questions maybe you can help me with. <clears throat> on the potential local transport rate analysis, under Shibu it says Sheboygan Fire Department BLS non-emergency, uh, Sheboygan Fire Department resident 575, non-resident 600. Uh, that's the rate that you would be, that was, would be the rate that you would billing somebody that has insurance? Or that would, that would well, that, be the, the would that be the gross bill to any category? We don't change the amount billed uh, by whether you have insurance or your Medicare, Medicaid, whatever. Everybody good. gets the same amount. Okay, good. Uh, then my follow-up question is then: uh, You're billing 575 and 600, depending on whether it's a resident or non-resident. But Medicare is only going to pay you 158 bucks for that call. And if it's Medicaid, they're going to pay you $94.90 .94 if it's a BLS non-emergency base. Or if it's an ALS non-emergency base, they're going, to, they're going to pay you $113.88. Now, what I need clarification on, and I, I realize you've been very busy the last few days, and I requested this information, is, and I know uh, Alderman Gish, and I have to be very careful how I say this, the, uh, the amount of money he talked about at the last meeting was $30 of additional marginal costs to do, to do one of these calls. As reported by the finance director, yes. not by okay, me. Okay, thank you. Uh, I guess I, I, I'm still wanting to find out, and I would like to see it in a detailed report, of what our actual marginal costs are for one of these calls when you consider the fact that you're gonna have two people out there for <coughs> an hour, an hour and a half. Uh, you're gonna have supplies involved. And then you're also going to have to restage the ambulance once it gets back to the fire department. And uh, I guess I have a little, pro a little trouble uh, uh, with the figure of if that's what it is, $30 of what your ad actual marginal costs are. Now, I guess there's a couple different ways you could handle this. You know, currently you charge out 25% of your paramedics time to ambulance and 75% of the fire department. You might want to, uh, after you review this, you might want to up that to let's say 27 or 30% of their time because if you get into this business, you're gonna, besides your ambulance calls, you're gonna be doing a lot more of these uh, transfers. So I think your marginal costs have to be adjusted in relation to the amount of more time they're gonna be spending on that side of the business in all fairness to getting a true picture of what the marginal costs are for this, this, this business. So I guess the bottom line is I would like to see something of how you're gonna adjust that or if you can give me a figure on one call what your additional <coughs> marginal costs are gonna be because of the manpower, the supplies, and restaging of the ambulance. And you know, I, I realize you've been busy and if you can get that to me within a reasonable amount of time, I certainly would appreciate it. I think I can give it to you in just an explanation. I, I believe that $30 is probably high. I believe it's probably a one gallon of gas because uh, the majority of our su supplies are reimbursed through the billing. Um, and the 75-25% allocation is not true. Um, as you know, the bottom four paramedics on our pay scale <coughs> are allocated to the ambulance fund. Mm -hmm. So. And you've asked me to run this like a business before, but what you've asked me is, okay, we allocate the cost of our employees to the fire department fund. 
$1,000 and the four to the ambulance fund, you've asked me to allocate all of our expenses of the 18 paramedics to the ambulance portion, but not subtracted from the fire department portion. Now you're asking me to allocate those same hours of time again to another revenue base. The IRS and private business looks at that as fraud as allocating your expenses three times over that are the same exact expense. I never asked you to do that. But I'm not saying you asked me to, to fraudulent no, I didn't reports, ask. but that you're asking me to charge out the two employees' times in three different spots, and you can't do that. It's, they're all paid from the city general fund, but they're only paid once. They're not paid three times. And, and that's where the whole discrepancy is with the ambulance, the fire-based ambulance here in Sheboygan, is that we have a hard time separating that out as to how do we allocate those expenses. But we can't do it more than once. Well, I guess I, I, guess I disagree with the fact that only 25% of your paramedics' time is being allocated to the ambulance uh, when they're making over 2,000 calls a year, and you've got more than four paramedics. You've got, what, 17 or 18 now? We have 18 that are physically on the ambulance. And if you look right. at actual time spent on calls in a 24-hour shift, it's roughly 1.85 hours per med crew, so times two people. We do not figure in their report time and cleanup time, which is pro you probably could double that time. Mm -hmm. So the true amount of time spent on ambulance calls in a 24-hour shift is probably about four hours each. Now, again, we can go back and say, okay, how about their training time? We need to allocate that. It's very difficult to do. Chief, if I could follow up, does that, uh, uh, the other time other than the 1.9 hours, I think that was 1.9 you said, the other time in their life, they're real firemen, right? The other time of their life, they're school teachers because we're in the schools. They are fire building inspectors uh, at the garden apartments on Calumet Drive. They were the hose crew that day right. at Med 4. Was I think people are confused oh. that only during those eight hours, all they are is ambulance. So the same people who were there, considering the bottom four are, four are gone now, who were there just acting as firemen and having downtime to play ping pong and make chili. And I've said that before to the fire department. I know they think that's kind of nasty, but just an illustration. They, of course, do more than that. Now, now they're spending 75% of their time Reven gener re generating revenue. Correct. They wouldn't, you wouldn't have less bodies, you would have less revenue. Alderman Versi. I can actually help the chief on this one. And this is where unit outer utilization really comes in. And it just shows, I've, I've, I did all of 2009 because that is a full record. Um, your, your unit hour utilization is basically every, every hour, you can see how many calls per hour is what's going on. Um, the best month we had last year for 2009 was the month of August. And that was one call for every 8.54 hours. Um, the rest of the months, January, it's one call for every 10 hours. February is one call for every 10.6. But that's the best month was August. So I mean, as far as allocating the expenses and allocating their time, it, I believe that would be accurate because you're not really running that many calls. So I mean, that would, that's helping you. But that's one thing that we talked about before that you should be doing more often is the unit hour utilization. So just to show council members, show the, show the city, and show yourself as of trying to run a business and where you're gonna go with the ambulance service. And if we do get the CAD RMS, I will be able to give you a much better year-end report than what has been submitted in the years before I became chief because <coughs> it's almost impossible for us to pull that out of anywhere right now. Mayor Ryan. Uh, thank you once again, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, I think the, the, the easiest way in trying to explain the whole fire department ambulance uh, uh, scenario to people. It takes four people to run a fire truck. And yet we only have two people on our trucks. The other two are on the ambulance. So that's one thing that everybody has to remember. And it's, it's really, it's taking it down to the lowest common denominator. It's dumbing it down. It takes four people to run a fire truck. Two of those four are on the ambulance. If you get rid of your ambulance, you still need four people to run a fire truck. So when it comes to cost allocation, and where, where, you know, where, do, you, where, do, you, where do you slot these people as far as uh, expense, um, you get rid of your ambulance, you still need those people on a fire truck. 
So that's, you know, that's really simplifying it, but that's what it comes down to. And, you know, that's, that's the easiest way to explain it to somebody that says just get rid of the ambulance, keep all the fire stations open. It just doesn't happen that way. Alderman Hannah? Aren't we just filing this document? Mm -hmm. That's the motion so far, yes. Okay. Call the question. I'll call the question. The question's been called. Alderman Radke, thank you. Um, and there's a second to that? Alderman yeah, Hannah? Second, thank absolutely. You. Okay, all in favor of calling the question. This is just a vote just to call the question. Say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Opposed? No. Motion carries. I'm sorry? Uh, no, I would want to, I had a couple more questions, but the majority rules, so it's, oh, I'm sorry. the and discussion one, is done. One against calling the question. One against. Okay. The question has been called. It's a two-thirds majority. Um, so on to the question of filing. All in favor say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We are not done yet. Uh, to the public now, who's been waiting patiently, we thank you. You've heard the um, discussions and uh, the difficulty that we face as a council um, on uh, the next council meeting, whatever that may be, and this issue comes up. Generally, we only have five people speaking. Uh, I wanted the public to have opportunity to speak on the issue uh, before we actually take a vote on it. So we do have 30-minute limit on public inputs, uh, two minutes per speaker again, as we did before, on the issue regarding the fire department. I think would like to speak. Um, please step forward. Chase? Chase? You need my address again? I've got it. All right, thanks. Okay. I'm not going to use the whole two minutes. <laughs> I don't even know where to start, but let me give a little, just let me go back a little bit because I don't want to get into an argument over negotiating contracts or at this time. But I think it's important for everybody in the council as well as the public to understand, and this isn't a slam to any other labor organization in this city, but back last year when we sat down with the city to work out a contract, we didn't get it in writing. We didn't give two extra percent for health insurance. We're not paying two extra 12% of our health insurance. What our, what our union did was give back 2% of our wages that went to health insurance. 2% of our wages we brought back under the auspice that, hey, maybe this will help get back the people we lost. And we did it because of how important staffing is, not only to the public, but how important it is to us to do our jobs. That's why we did it. it. Came out of our wages to come back and help the city and the citizens run this city fire department. Uh, looking forward, this union came together months ago and decided to sit down and look at what we could do to help out the city again because we knew that we needed to move forward on this issue. We thought we were, I'll even t I'll say uh, upset, maybe isn't the best word, that even at my own, myself and some of the members on my group who sat down with city leaders and negotiated that contract under a thought that we would get those people back with the 2% of our wages we, we gave back, which again, like I said, no other labor union did in this city. Uh, we sat back down and offered, let's, what else could we do? So we came up with another concession. What we're doing here is trying to help and get the city to have the best fire department it can have, the fire department it needs and deserves. And, is my two minutes up? Your two minutes are up. Oh, so close, but I won't go on. You'll all hear me in a cliffhanger. <laughs> <laughs> to be continued. <laughs> My position has always been fiscal responsibility, accountability, and transparency in any government entity. This alone makes my position right, based on the fact, not fiction, of today's incompetent and management from City Hall on down to the Sheboygan Fire Department, among other departments. City Hall gave away the bank and now is saddled with obligations beyond its control and now must face the music of further necessary cuts. As far as the ambulance service is concerned, that was explained this Monday last and must be shut down completely. This is a moral decision based on uncalled for government intrusion into private enterprise for the initial sole purpose of saving unneeded jobs and quite naturally grew into an incompetently managed and financially unsustainable bureaucracy. Point of order. I don't think this committee, based on decorum, can accept 
incompetency and words such as that to describe either. either Is this going to be a public hearing or not? Or the city. We have rules on public hearings, sir. Well, you make them up as you go along. In the end, you have almost a third of the Sheboygan Fire Department's budget required Mr. for Chair. pension, and that's only one department. It needs to be brought to an end for the city to remain a viable entity to its citizens. Shutting down the complete Sheboygan Fire Department and reopening it the next day as the Sheboygan Volunteer Fire Department is another option. The city's inability through frequent political changes to affect a stable government for the benefit of its citizens cries for a change to a city administrator form of government. The support you seem to show for a continuation of business as usual is totally unacceptable and can be shown only as more inevitable and unnecessary waste. Good night. Anybody else like to speak today? Please. Yeah. Uh, Matt Polson, 2822 South 19th Street. Uh, I just want to uh, finish Chase's statement, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, uh, our, our concession that we made this year um, was intended to get the guys hired already. Our offer that we've made for next year is hopefully going to cement that. Um, we had some discussions last week or two. Um, you know, we, it will get us through to the end of 11 when our contract for 12 and going forward will be open. We are more than willing to uh, work with the city at that time. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to speak this evening? Okay, anybody else like to speak this evening? And is this a public issue or? It is, and it's a good thing. Okay, I need to, I need to ask one more time for the public and then we'll move on. Anybody else in the public like to speak this evening? Okay, I'll then walk. I, I want to commend Chief Herman uh, for his articulateness tonight and his endurance. He uh, spent <laughs> two and a half hours and articulated several business scenarios very well. Uh, and uh, I want to commend him for that. Uh, and I also want to mention that, acknowledge that there's a young lady that's potentially still floating out on Lake Michigan. While we've been having this conversation, there's a real incident going on, a real life emergency response incident going on. And, and uh, so I want to acknowledge that and keep your thoughts and prayers tonight if that's still going on. Um, and I want to add one last pers perspective because I'm a sap and a, of an idealist. And that is, I heard some people get exhausted out there and kind of sigh and stuff, but this stuff's thrilling to me because um, I and probably Don, the mayor, maybe, maybe not, and Chase, we've served in, I can count, uh, I can't count on two hands the number of countries I've served in where they don't get to have this kind of dialogue. And so I am thrilled tonight. I'm not worried about the police department showing up at my door in the middle of the night and, uh, and intimidating me. I'm not worried about Chief Domogalski's guys pulling me and my wife over to intimidate me. I'm not worried about what the press, I mean, every one of you can say whatever you want in the press and on the blogs tonight. And that's because of the magic that is this very special, rare country that we live in. And so it, it, we disagree. How are we going to fund the police department? What should we all be paid? We disagree on that. But outside these doors, we're neighbors and Americans. And the fact that we can have this conversation and everybody get their turn and, and Carter can have his turn and we can all have our turn, <laughs> that's a beautiful, special thing. And I want you to think about that as you go home. And I appreciate your indulgence, Mr. Chief. Alder Wongman? Just a, just a comment, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Alder Mingisha, I have to disagree with you. I think Mr. Paulus has a right to speak his opinion. He was giving us an opinion. He wasn't stating a hardcore fact, but it was his opinion. He has a right to say that, I believe. And I really am quite dismayed that, uh, you know, he, he was being subjected to uh, some scorn because of what he said. Any time that this committee starts facing people or having people come up to the podium and telling them that uh, we don't like what they're saying, I, th I think we're overstepping the line there, and I think that's a rather serious breach. I right, need a motion to adjourn. Second. Is there a motion made? Alderman Bach, second. Alan Gisha, all in favor say aye. aye. We stand adjourned. <laughs>